Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County work session on Wednesday, April 22nd, 2020. I, I need a motion to go into closed session. So moved. Pursuit to general provisions of Article 3-305, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County, I move we meet in closed session at 5 o'clock to consider matters that relate to negotiations. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions or comments on the motions? Hearing none, I call for the vote to go, uh, to go into closed session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We'll be back shortly. Thank you so much. We have in here one, two, three. Do we need to... And we are back. Next on our agenda, we have a budget update. Mr. Pfister. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll begin with some, um, just to refresh your memory, a couple of uh, data points from the requested FY 2021 budget. We're going to share some updated revenue estimates. We're gonna present a possible budget balancing scenario. And then we're gonna offer a couple of other uh, balancing object um, options, budget balancing options. As you know, these were the priorities that the board established, uh, safety and secure, uh, student safety, classroom supports, teacher class size ratio, compensation for all employees. Those were the priorities that were identified as we uh, worked through the budget process with the board. And when we did acknowledge the fact that we needed to make some tough decisions, what you're looking at now, you've seen before, it's a slide that shows some of the uh, requests that we had, but we, from schools and departments, but we ended up having to cut those. It's over a uh, over million, about $1.1 million. And then what we're gonna take you through next is um, just a um, update with, um, uh, our revenues and what we have, what we're proposing in terms of um, of some cuts, really, to balance the budget. So I'm going to turn it over at this point to Mr. Fister. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Um, board members, uh, just real quickly, just want to uh, reemphasize what you saw just a little over a month ago. Uh, what Dr. Kane's request was, what this board approved, was a $5.6 million increase to our FY20 budget, giving us a grand total budget of just over $109 million. Um, and you can see that the majority of those funds came from the county with $5 million. We decided not to use any uh, fund balance like we did in the current year. So that's a negative $234,000 revenue um, estimate. And then $804,000 uh, still today is our estimate that what we would receive from the uh, state. Um, the summary of that, 86.1% of all of that money that we did request and you approved uh, was going to hit the classroom. 7.48 um, positions, compensation and benefits, the virtual academy, some special ed and curriculum needs, uh, and then transportation and then some operational needs across the system. So I just kind of wanted to reset where we were uh, as far as the budget that this board approved. However, uh, with some recent information that we've obtained through the county, uh, they are looking at, th through the county administrators of budget, funding the Board of Education at Maintenance of Effort, and that's the green highlighted information there, um, that we will be funded at MOE. Uh, and just, again, maintenance of effort is they pay us the same amount per pupil in the current year as they did in the prior year. Uh, of course, it's adjusted for enrollment. As our enrollment goes up, the maintenance of effort would go up. If enrollment goes down, maintenance of effort will go down. Is the number of students dropped or the wealth increased? Students uh, dropped or the wealth increased? Uh, the, wealth inc the wealth increased. We are the second highest increase in wealth per pupil uh, across the state, Queen Anne's County experienced in for the FY21 calculations. But a standard maintenance of effort is just simply a calculation of this take what they gave us divided by the number of students then multiply that number by the number of students we have in the following year and that's what the minimum is that they're expected to require however which has happened in the past few years that, that amount has been below the statewide average and there is a calculation called education effort which is maintenance of effort so they have a new floor and it's the minimum of those three numbers that's shown in the slide. Either the county's increase in wealth per pupil, 5.8%, the statewide average increase of wealth per pupil, which was 4.5, or the minimum 2.5 floor. So for the last couple of years, we've had that 2.5% floor added to our maintenance of effort, which we will again um, this year um, because it was below those numbers. So maintenance of effort was increased with the education effort. 
but it still is the, it becomes the new floor. It, it, was there any discussion that if the decrease in revenue for the county did not materialize in the amount that they would put some money aside to help us? I, you can't plan based on that kind of thing, but I remember in the past that kind of promise or suggestion maybe. So, so the only um, option available to the county to go below maintenance of effort would be to actually um, send in a formal request or a waiver to Maryland State Board of I'm Education. About that. I'm talking about the maintenance of effort is required by law. Yes, sir. And the county is most likely saying the reason they're doing that is a shortfall in revenue that they're anticipating. Okay. If the shortfall is not as much as they anticipate, is there any hope that we get a portion of that? I mean, after all, we're half of uh, the county's budget and the, so, it's not like we don't have unimportant activities here. Correct. So the only way that beyond what was established on July 1, if for some reason their revenue estimates were greater than what they anticipated that they set our benefit for, they could certainly always come back and give us an additional appropriation. But that would be under the purview of the county, nothing that we would be able to initiate. Remember some period of time a letter came out saying that they would do that, but they didn't say an amount, but, but there is no such letter. Okay. I, I have a question. Are we they have called a maintenance of effort also education effort so education effort is a component of maintenance of right, effort for that in their minds no yes they're, they're okay. very well so that's aware. what they're saying we they know they have to give both oh absolutely of those. okay oh absolutely yes ma'am <clears throat> So with that in mind, our revised ev re revenue estimates are now at $2.3 million, which would bring our budget into $105.6 million. Again, the state funds, as I know as of today, is still that same $804,000. Um, the county revenue for maintenance of effort, 1542178. And then to show this slide, to kind of um, move us forward into one of the balancing scenarios, um, what I've done here is estimated that we would use $200,000 of fund balance, not the full 234, but we would use $200,000 of uh, fund balance to help balance the budget that we'll be talking about shortly. So again, with that, our new or revised budget request on this scenario would be $105.6 million. So, sir, question, you see, taking I'm sorry. money out of a fund balance to do a reoccurring cost as an accounting principle, is that a good idea? No, it should be only used for one time how long do you think that's sustainable? If we keep, we did 234 last year, which we decided to take it out this year. Now you're think you're suggesting, or somebody's suggesting, we put it back in. So uh, how long do you think that's? So if last? we were to have a completely balanced budget, doing this scenario, we would be out of fund balance within five years. That's that would be that we spent everything that we had given, but you know, good accounting practices would be, you would have a, a fund balance every year. However, last year's fund balance was only $72,000. So here we use 234, but we only gained 72 of it back. So the net 150. If you put that out there, yeah, you could get to about seven years of doing it that way. But it should be, fund balance should only be used for one-time expenditures. It should not be used as an ongoing revenue source. So we're spending more fund balance than what we're receiving at the end of the year. Yes. It just seems last like year. we're going down a, a tunnel that it's great right now, but you know we're going to have trouble in the future. To sustain using fund balance as a revenue source, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm going by the calculations here and by what the pupil funding. We are only having 7,500 students. 7,505. Yeah, the, the pre-K kids are not in that. Correct. In that total. That's why. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm coming off. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, we're not funded for our pre-K yeah, students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. You, you, Thank you. I, I totally I'm a little confused. That. Okay, the, the county's giving us what? The new, the revised county. That would be this number here. So, with maintenance of effort, the new FY21 estimate would be sixty-one point zero three three million dollars. They give an additional million and a half. Where is? I'm sorry. I'm not. The I'm just last not. column. The, the slide that's up there. So we currently are getting fifty-nine point four nine one. Right. Maintenance of effort is 1.542, which would give us a 61.03. That's what they're giving us. Yeah, for the that's what's in the county administrator's budget. Right. Right and now. And what you're saying is we, we use 200,000 of our fund balance and then what? Then 
to put so in, in so in this scenario that's up on the screen right now what we're estimating is taking our current budget adding the 804 from the state the 1.5 from the county and adding back two hundred thousand dollars of our own fund balance would, would create our revenue source so we would be increasing our revenue by two point three million dollars to sir. fund our budget for next year would be the total increase well, why do I come up with 3.3? What they gave, what we asked for versus what you're estimating now is 3.3. I'm sorry, uh, maybe I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry about my brain here today. Um, but it looks like to me, revenue increases between the state funds and county funds is 2.346. Yes. Right. And we're adding out of fund balance, which is a whole nother story, another 200. So we're looking like two and a half million dollars no, so look look at the, what I have on the screen. Because we use two hundred and thirty four thousand dollars of fund balance, mm -hmm. and I'm only using two hundred this this year. That's a thirty four thousand dollar revenue reduction. So focus on the the middle column. I'm getting eight hundred and four from the state, one point five from the county, and instead of that, as we talked about and what we passed in there in your in your budget of a negative two thirty four, it's now only a negative thirty four because I'm saying I'm going to use two hundred thousand of my fund balance. I guess in accounting system that looks right. In a practical point, you're using the fund balance to do a reoccurring cost, which I'm just having a hard time to guess. I understand. The important question is where did the fund balance come from? Is it lapsation for people that we should have hired and and for some reason didn't get it it's an hired. accumulation of all the many years that queen anne's county has been doing this so it's it just accumulates from year to year but in a general sense any money that we have left over can be attributed to anything it could be attributed to a, a warm winter yeah. it could be attributed to um lack of transportation needs for non-public students it could be salaries is the yeah. Big one. yeah but we already build in we have people that we thought we were going to get yeah but we know we already build in that this base budget a four hundred thousand dollar salary attrition number less than full salary the lower the increases for the teachers the bigger the slams going to be when Kerwin hits and we have to start the build up I uh, was it five years to get the starting rate at sixty thousand yeah. dollars you know our starting rate is what 40 48 close to 50 47 and 48, 48. Yeah, 48. Mm -hmm. and uh, you can get away with some compression but it's pretty soon when the starting salary starts getting pretty close to the top salaries that people are going to uh, react negatively yeah. so okay. hey, you just really give me a real simple terms we asked for how much more five than, point than they have agreed to give us we asked for over $3 million more than what they've agreed to give us. Okay, that's what I have down here. Okay. $3.5 million in total. $1.5 is what they're going to give us. So, so it's a $3.5 million swing between what we asked for right. and what they've now said or what they have put in their budget. And I, and I just want to reemphasize that is what is put in their budget, not what they told us that we're going to be funded. It's what was in the county administrator's budget. Commissioner can always change that as they have in the past. I, I didn't want to... Uh, dwell on this but it's important that this fund balance is a fictitious number because it was put in the budget to pay for additions and things that are important uh, because they didn't happen we have still holes that are continuing forward uh, in other words we don't have the money to pay for what we put in last year's budget so therefore that it's not in this year's budget, at least I don't think. So what your your general sense of this is absolutely correct. This isn't something, this is the first time when I came here, I was astounded. I said, you can't use fund balance to balance your budget. But that unfortunately is a practice that this district has gotten into over the years because they don't get the funding um, that they need to get. And so it is, it is there's exactly way, what it is. There's a way to create a crisis and that is to put five hundred thousand dollars in a fiduciary account and it can't be touched except for the purpose that it was put there then we have no fund balance we have a negative and are they going to let the school system flounder as good as it is today i hope not unfortunately these 
are the practices that we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. that, you know, we, we have, have to, deal, to deal with what we're we doing. have to have a, a we have to have a balanced budget. We have to support our students, and, and this we is we've done a darn good job at that. Well, this I don't remember when. Well, at one time, I remember that we we had more than the MOE. Oh, we did last, last year. year. Yeah. Last year we were we funded did. over MOU, mm -hmm. but prior to that, I believe it was seven out of nine years we were funded at MOE. Yes. Yeah. So can you clarify one more time? I see now we've we've lo lowered it to three two point three over, in instead of the original three point five over. Right? Is what you're saying? No. Oh. No, ma'am. Okay. We're at zero over. We were at three point five over, from the county. Yeah. So. We, we can, we've always asked for this 1542 number. We've always asked for it. Then we asked for an additional $3.5 million to help fund our budget. Now that number is zero. So we've lost from the county, not lost, I'm sorry, revised our revenue estimates from the county down by $3.5 million. Okay, so where's that coming from? Yeah. So I think well, if if, 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 you, like, if when he that. continues, right? Yeah. All right. I'm like, we're all the way down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we're balanced. No, what no, is we don't have gone through where the cuts are coming from. No, haven't done that yet. No, ma'am. The slides. Got it. Yeah. Got yep. it. Okay. So again, so now here we go. Here's right. where the cuts I'm are coming. So we're still gonna. This is the same presentation that you saw when we adopted the budget. I've added a column, the revised. So what you're gonna see, any place that you see the bright yellow, that's a change. Either it's been reduced or it's been made zero. So the two title two teachers that we wanted to move from the grant to the general fund, we said, okay, let's do it in two years instead of all in one. So we will move one of those teachers. The science curriculum MOI has gone away. It's down to zero. It was a $36,000 ask. The core instructional programs, zero. The 504 plan software that we just implemented, zero. The Midshore Special Education Consortium, the $130,000 we need to balance the budget, zero. Hopefully we can take that, or we will be able to take that out of Medicaid funding one more time. Um, it's, again, not an ongoing good practice because it's a fund balance of a, of a restricted fund, but it's most appropriate to use it as we did this year to balance the Midshore Special Education uh, shortfall. Non-public placements, 255, we're riding on the fact that we won't have an increase or we'll have a decrease in the number of non-public placements. The Comar required training of $7,000. If that is needs to continue, we'll just have to work with, within the special ed staff to fund that. The coordinator of health services, that has to stay. We've hired that position. We don't have that position in the budget. That has to be an add to this budget, so that's why it remains. The school-based staffing request of 3.848 positions goes to, away, as well as the paraprofessional, and as well as the curriculum writing stipends and leadership development of $85,000. The substitutes for our mentors goes away. The board certified behavior analyst, it's a contracted position that goes away. We are keeping the $158,000 for the virtual learning academy licenses. Again, an un another unfunded uh, item that we have to put into the budget. And then the $10,000 primary talent and development uh, stipends of $10,000 as down to zero. So our original request that this board approved of 1.505 in learning accountability and results is now down to $330,080. Safety and security was a zero request. It's now still a zero request. Most of the safety and security needs that we are putting in place are gonna be grant funded, so it didn't have an impact on the operating budget. For operational effectiveness, as we just finished uh, having discussions on bus contracts, uh, that will remain the same because again, we're contractually obligated to pay that increase going forward at this point. Some of the operational amounts that we'll see here between transportation, operation plan, and maintenance we're just so unsure as to what the continuation of this COVID-19 crisis has. We know we're gonna to have to buy additional supplies, custodial supplies, maybe some safety equipment. How it has the effect on transportation with the, the learning that's gonna be having to go on. So what we did, instead of wiping these completely out, we cut them in half. So the operations within transportation went from 91 to 40,500. We did take out the uh, some of the overtime for transportation, but we were left the bus driver uh, in there uh, and some additional uh, salary. So that's 63,000 from an $83,000 request. The Kent Island High School activity bus is cut. The operation to plant operational increases again, we cut that in half because we just know that we're gonna have to buy some additional materials for the safety of our students and staff. Have we had a problem with special education transportation in, over this last year being in a, in a negative? Yes. And 
it's been in a negative this year, and then you sitting there making a recommendation to cut it and cut it again. So not rec rec recommendation to cut the increase to help us get back into a positive state. But yes, you are correct. Tell me it's not, I, not cutting I mean, the current I mean, budget, good, cutting I mean, the request. I it, but <laughs> that's a place where we've had some issues in this past yes. year. Transportation and special if, ed. If that's realistic, to, if you're not going to come to us in June or January, February next year and say, hey, we got a problem. We, we very it, again, a lot of that is contingent upon the number of students we have placed. I mean, earlier we, we said that we weren't going to need to increase non public. Declined. I'm sorry? Our graphs have not showed a decline. Looks no, like not at this point. Up. We're still educating the same amount of students, but with the non-public, a lot of this is driven by the non-public and the homeless. If we have a reduction in homeless, of course, with the economy, that liable to be an increase in the number of homeless students that we have to transport. So, yeah, this is just a, a a quick overview of where we are, just to kind of set some of the things forward for us to have these discussions as we get down to June 30th and have to adopt uh, this budget. But we're not prepared to. We're talking about whether we agree with all this or not right now. That's just our presentation on just some thoughts on how to come up with a balanced budget. Okay. Um, the um, why do we think all of a sudden we're not going to have non-placement? We, we, we don't. We just we just took out, we basically are cutting, and you'll continue to, to hear what um, the thinking is. And I think probably it's best to get all the way through um, so that you can have a, a full picture and, and then pose that question when we get to the end of this, I think okay. would be better because okay. there's more. <laughs> and, and there's so more the to one, The one FTE is, is our bus driver. Yes. Our bus driver. Okay. So just keep in mind, these are the, the cuts of the request. It has nothing to do with our base right, budget. Right, the request. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, maintenance of uh, plant, we cut that request in half. The carpenter locksmith, uh, that request has uh, been taken away. Same with technology, uh, we cut that in half. The accountant for fiscal reporting has gone away um, and the athletic um, uh, director pilot uh, of $42,000. Uh, we've explain, reduced that down to zero. Could you explain what finance accountant, that's just a position, right? So it was just a position, yeah. yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The technology license, just, okay, just a question. I know we're gonna move on, but mm -hmm. are these licenses we're required to pay? Or with these so as as we talked about during all of our budget discussions, some of these things are just what we call operational increases. Every year, the software will go up two percent. Okay, we're not keeping pace with that. So we will either have to restructure some funds from within, or there could possibly be software or curriculum things that we just will not be able to afford to put in place anymore. Okay, I have a question about the athletic director. I That's thought that position was coming. That money was coming from a position who was retiring. It is, so this was a net of, of, of that. So a position was retiring, we were going to reorg that, but then it required a, a full-time, a, a higher level position, and that's the netting of these two. So we still have an athletic director. It's just we wouldn't be able to uh, split. Be a, correct. Right, be a split, yeah. So that original request under operational effectiveness that had three positions for 685,000 is now one position for 337,000. Under human capital, so we have settled agreements and compensation of $2.5 million, that remains. The health insurance, we're going to experiencing a 6% increase, that has to remain, the $662,000 increase in health insurance. Employee and teacher retirement, that $60,000 has to remain. The life insurance, we've had a large increase in our life insurance costs, $47,000, that has to remain. And then the minimum wage requirements, I mean, that's by law right there. Uh, this is a duplicate of the 100,000 that we put in the budget this year that will need to continue. A little bit of student service mileage and materials, that $500 has been cut. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say the compensation settled agreement is something that has to remain. It doesn't have to remain. That part of yeah. the agreement is, is if we have an issue with money, then we can go back and renegotiate. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And but these so, are already signed. Right, just for this example is, is what we've left it here. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. Yeah. The supplemental pre-K, so this is an add back that we recently found out going through the supplemental pre-K application process for the current year. MSD had changed their guidance. So last year when we used these funds and it was, well, we're giving you money for what you're already doing, we were able to use that money to do some classroom positions at some of their elementary schools. Now what they are telling us is that was no longer allowed and therefore we have to add back in the money that we took for, uh, to pay for those staffing 
technically we will not get this money from MSDE this year, so we have to fund it with internal, uh, internal funds. So we are adding back three positions and $217,000. And then to balance this budget, staffing cuts of 27 positions for negative $1.9 million. So under human capital, where we were not adding any positions and a request of $3 million, we would be cutting a net of 24 positions for only a, for a $1.645 million gain. Can you give us just a quick example of staffing cuts? So this is just a real high level of 27 times their standard teacher rate. Average I, salary. It's not, we haven't identified, Dr. Kane, these, these positions. I mean, we're looking at laying off teachers. Are we looking at laying off? What we would have to do is literally, because we don't have um, um, a, like a contingency of positions for teachers that we don't hire for, we may have a vacancy right now, but that's because somebody you know left, but that position would need to be refilled. What we're talking about here is 27 positions at an average teacher salary. We use about 72,000 as a placeholder for salary and benefits, and about 27 of them, um, after you do the three, would be 24, would have to um, be cut. And when I say cut, what we've done in the past is we identify the dollar figure that we need to get to, the reduction that we need to get to. And then we start to look at, um, you know, who was hired last, what position, or do we have another teacher that can um, sort of take those students, you know, several other teachers probably what it would be that would have to take those students. So class sizes definitely do increase. What we did um, a couple of years ago is we identified um, eight positions that we need to cut. We were able to replace teachers into vacant positions at the start of the next school year so that we didn't lose a person, but we definitely lost eight positions. And so it would be a similar thing. So I, I guess, and we'll get more detail. Like you said, this is a snapshot. This like is that. a snapshot. We have not identified any teachers or, or anything like that. Um, but we are looking at the dollar amount that we need to reduce to get to a balanced budget. Okay. And, and, and I just got to say, it just looks like before I lose people, I'm going to look at how we do XX compensation too, because there's a balancing act there. Do we? And, her, you know, and we'll go through later mm -hmm. on. And yeah, we'll, we'll share that with you as well. But the reason, um, Captain Kelly, where I said, hang on one second, because there's more, is that last line there, that 27. So that's why we're cutting you know, everything else except for things that have to do with COVID, sanitizing, clean, all of those kinds of things because we don't know where we're gonna be next year. This is a scenario, right? So absolutely there are other things that you'll have some ideas about, but this is a scenario and this helps everybody to understand the gravity of this situation, right? So if you go to the next slide, um, Mr. Fister. There. The workforce coordinator. Mm -hmm. Keep yep. going. Got to go. Mm -hmm. that, that has to go um, as well. Keep going okay. because we'll, co we'll come to the other balancing options is what I want to get are. you to. So. so the other balancing options, um, and again, this is just first blush, uh, a furlough day for all employees. Before you start. You had down there the health coordinator. Is that only because we've already hired it? Yes. We yes, aren't yes. reducing mm -hmm. that one like we did the workforce? No, we, because we have to have somebody to supervise the nurses. And we did, yes, we did hire, hire. with the dollars that... Never did get funding for having to do that from anybody. We, we did for the rest of this school year. Only mm -hmm. nothing. But not for, no, not moving forward. We did not. Not a maintenance of mm -hmm. effort. So the difference between the cost of what we've spent this year... The, the cost of that bill is, is 100000 is what Correct. Saying. Okay. That's okay. including benefits. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. okay. All right. I got it. Thanks. Sorry. It's okay. So the other balancing options that, you know, we just want to throw out there is a furlough day for all employees is about $280,000. We could certainly, to what Captain Kelly mentioned, we could certainly go back in and renegotiate some of our settled agreements, depending on what that is, uh, whether we would take a step or a, or a COLA reduction or something like that. But I do want to keep in mind with the board that in order for the teachers 
to continue to receive the $544,000 Kerwin match from last year, we have to at least maintain a 3% salary increase over the current year. So if we start playing in this area, we do not want to, or depending on the fiscal situation, jeopardize the state money for those uh, teachers as well. Has there been any that starts at what time? At the state level with this Kerwin thing? I mean, it was never funded from I think adequately. So, I mean, the state, where it, county's got issues, the state's got issues too. Are they looking at this as not maybe being I, I believe on April 7th, all of the bills have been transferred to the governor, mm -hmm. and then he has 30 days to act on that. So we may not be able to get a more definitive answer until May 7th on that as to what the action of that is. Uh, but even, and then there's a bunch of scenarios that could possibly happen. He could certainly sign it, he could certainly veto it, and then he got the implications of that, and then he could do nothing with it. And then there's implications you know, surrounding about that. And then, of course, there's the budget and the impacts of there and the fiscal bills and everything. So it's still too early to determine what the final issue is going to be with Blueprint. And we may not know until at least May 7th. And then after that, we may not have a definitive answer based on what the legislature does. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just, but it is the largest funding increase in next year's budget. Um, and I would think that that would have to be addressed somehow. Yeah, because, uh -huh. I mean, there, that is conditioned on the budget we submit to be 3% higher in what? Salaries for teachers. The, uh, the starting salary for teachers? No, salaries in an aggregate. Salaries in an aggregate just for teachers. That would be pretty silly right. not oh, to do. Oh, yeah, so what is that number, 3% of that? So You're talking 1% was 640. That was for the entire staff. What is that? So just multiply it by three hundred one point oh, eight. That's not the entire staff. Six. Yeah, but if you but if you do one percent, not the entire staff, just the teachers. Teachers, just teachers. Well, that's most of it. But the three percent be about one point four. One point four. Three percent for t for teacher salaries is in this budget, based on requirement. Yes. Based on the the what has already been settled. Yes. More than that is in. And this. yes, the definition of teacher is what. Well, we can get into that later. Right. We can we can yeah. give that to you later, yeah. sir. As it, far as the Kerwin, so one point four is the minimum Silly. we need. I, I, we'll give it to you. For the purposes of this, um, we need to. In a, in a nutshell, this is a snapshot of some proposals. Correct. That you can look at. Just giving us a heads up. Correct. There'll be a lot more. In a discussion. The, the, after next week, and even after the commissioners strike their budget, what sometime in May. Mm -hmm. So that's when the rubber's going to hit the road where we, we'll have some tough meetings to make some quick decisions. Uh, so what are we driving? I thought we were going into her meeting with what? We um, already have the, you've already approved the budget that I'm going in. That's the meeting in. you're going into? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. We're just, there's just our sense. normal presentation that yep. we would normally do. What is it that we asked for? I just think oh, yeah, we're doing our due that. diligence yeah. to well, I just don't understand what we're doing right now then. But what you're doing right now is she has taken out they have the executive team has taken out all the things that we have asked for to make it look what it should if look we were at only we it are not funded at what we had asked for so part so of last all this has to come out right the part of the last board meeting we talked about that you'd seen in the newspaper and subsequently we also saw that we would likely be funded at maintenance of effort and so this is an attempt to help you understand that we are thinking about some different scenarios just as we always do in the event that we are funded at maintenance of effort we have painted a picture for you that is is initial and says 27 positions and everything else new pretty much that we requested and then we say okay and here are some other things that you want to think about some other balancing options compensation for renegotiation um, and I know I didn't let you get down all the way in the go list ahead, take, but, it take, um, take it um, go ahead but, take you know um, using fund balance which nobody wants to do but certainly that is something that you know has been done um, we already talked about furlough what the cost of a furlough day would be and then there's also some stimulus funds um, which you know would certainly be a one-time use but and we aren't 100 percent certain on what they would be um, and the uses for them but we just wanted to give you some understanding of what some options are that we'll have to have some conversations about and the gravity of what the 
the reduction would be yeah. from what we asked. I'm sorry, I, I lost track of where we were in the process. I thought no. we were trying to make some of these decisions now. And I'm like, no, no. this no, no, is no. going way too fast for that. No, no. Okay, this is thank you. Not right now. You. We, we don't have to do this next until next Tuesday's presentation. We won't know for another two or three weeks. Correct. Because the county is going to take. You're just making a presentation to county like you did to us. Correct. Then the county is going to strike their budget. I don't know what it is, May the fifteenth or twentieth or whatever. That's and after that date, we're going to have. 30 days up till June the 30th to strike our budget, which will be a realistic budget at that point. And here are just some scenarios in which we're going to have to That's correct. correct. Mr. Uh, Smith, we have to approve our budget by June, by June 30th. Right. Mm -hmm. How are we? The very, very, we will have a lot of days, a lot of workshop days uh, on the budget here in the, from, like you said, from May 20th through, through June. Yes, ma'am. How are we, they're not having their hearings, so how are we going, how is the public going to know this is going to be the impact? Um, it will probably be televised. Uh, as um, this just, is. Right, exactly. Just like this is, their last okay. um, meetings have been televised, so I'm sure it probably will be. So just to reiterate my point back during our board work sessions, I, I just happened to flip through this and found about $145,000 that we can cut out of this besides what you have here. Because I, again, I am loath to go into fund balance. I want to use as less as, that of, as possible. So, you know, that's another part of the scenario that we haven't discussed. Which down the road, we will. But we could definitely work on that as well. Yes, ma'am. I want to clarify what's going to be televised. We're going to have hearings. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't heard anything. I heard you just say that, but I don't know. No, I, I just heard. wondered, you know, how the public is going to know it other than us standing here right now and saying After we're going to be cutting. My interpretation is they're meeting with department heads, which Dr. King which is, is what a we're department doing. head for mm -hmm. the Board of Education mm -hmm. to submit a budget. Mm -hmm. Then they will have three days. They usually have one in uh, yes. Ken Island, Centerville, and Subdersville. I guess it's going to be televised, which I'm assuming they'll have three or at least one public thing where people can call in and make comments. And and I think that's what your question is, is how are they going to do it? I do not know. Because your budget is, you're not going to say, here's the impact if you don't give it to us when you present to them. Correct. So that's right not, now, that's not the, that meeting. Right. What this meeting is next week is for me to present the approved request, right? And so after that, that's when we get into this kind of thing. Well, I think it's important that the public knows that mm -hmm. this is important right now. Mm -hmm. And we're at least given first notice of what's going to be the impact. Mm -hmm. And then... You know, then we somehow we need to notify them of the impact when we don't get what we want. Well, I think everybody's and our be safe. our our meetings are televised, and that's generally where we get into what we're talking about right now. Right. So and, next and slide. Really, just to follow up with this, the fund balance, just to reset it, you know, we were talking about a use of additional fund balance. We only have $1.1 million in unassigned fund balance that we could even possibly play with. And again, I would not recommend um, using that. And, and, unless we had some assurances going down the road that we would be funded adequately. Um, and then on the capital budget, and I'll just go through this real quickly. Um, again, same thing, anything in green uh, is being cut. So as far as the capital budget, the what is in the county administrator's budget, the planning and design for the central office of $2 million has been cut. But everything that has a state component has been fully funded as shown here. As far I as thought the, that was on the Commissioners, it's, it's they're cutting it. Yeah. Okay. It's not in the county administrator's Falling budget. There. Yes, okay. That could always be added back, but it's not on the county administrator's okay. budget. Comprehensive building assessment basically cut in half from 1.7 down to 852. It was missing that was on the budget. I'm sorry? Meta Peak Elementary School, uh, there was 125000 or $140,000 for the capital, or was that in the operating That's budget? Year, it shouldn't have been. This year's. It may be under the systemic piece. This is just the, these are just the projects where there is a state component match at this point. What I don't want to see is it's not listed specifically with the rest of those systemic projects. And as a result, it'll get lost in the shuffle. And I don't want to see that happen. This is everything. Yeah. The Mattapeak floor is not a part of this? It's a recurring mm -hmm. thing, and it's just going to eat up our budget. We just got to get a capital. It is in the, the other if it goes to the next slide. Oh, the next slide. It's encompassed in the building, yeah, but the comprehensive building right. assessment. And the comp and, and I, we can break that out for you. I mean, it, it's a lengthy list. 
in the comprehensive building assessment, the Mad Peak floor will be in, in that. The Mad Peak floor, we are currently doing- It's this year, right? We're doing that right now. It's this, oh, it's this okay. year's budget. But there, was, yeah. there was a few things on there for windows for Mad Peak Elementary School, I think is what Mr. Anderson is referencing. Oh, the soffits, uh, there were drain uh, of rainwater that doesn't they, pool. It had to deal with a trench work. Uh, they were replaced two weeks ago, and the trench work uh, is being done right now. So we've actually seen tremendous good. progress with that. Okay. Okay. It's, it was good. And, and can keep in mind, this is the 21 capital budget. Yeah. Okay. 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 So the comprehensive building assessment, all the projects that fall under that, has basically been cut in half. Uh, the athletic request from 272 down to 97. Classroom technology, thankfully, stayed at 100. Uh, custodial equipment, zero. Fleet replacement, um, more than half was cut. They cut this budget? Yes, this is in the county administrator's budget. So the numbers you see in green or in white in that far right column, as, as indicated, county administrator's proposed budget. So these are the cuts. Anything with a line through it is, is different than what's in the right-hand column. Fleet vehicles was, was cut by more than half. Food service equipment was cut by two-thirds. Furniture replacement was cut by more than half. Uh, maintenance equipment, miscellaneous projects, PA intercom all cut to zero. Phone system replacement though was remained intact. The playground equipment of almost a half million dollars was funded at nothing. And some of the upgrades and repairs needed for portables was cut about in half. And then security upgrades, a, a small reduction there. The transportation for buses and cameras, because obviously we have to replace our buses when they hit their useful life, they have to be replaced. And then the cameras, um, so that was fully funded. The technology plan, we may have to do some work there because our minimum was 1.4, but they only funded it at 1.2. So hopefully we can get some additional funding in that line. What are and we gonna do about our contracts? That's the concern. Okay. All right. I can't that's believe we're cutting that after everything we've just now gone through. Yeah. The technology, I mean, really? We need to talk to them. Did he yeah. give you any ideas why, where? No, I mean, this was in the administrative, which, which I'm sure was pre, a lot of the discussions were pre-COVID, breaking, okay. you know, when they presented this. I'm All sure right. there were some adjustments, but right. I would think the majority of it was pre-COVID. And then textbooks, a $200,000 reduction. So what Mr. Pender and his team put in a request of $12.2 million through Dr. Kane and this board is now only $7.167 million. On what basis? Do the five county commissioners have any idea what this is for? I mean, did, did we have a discussion and, and they, and we, we, we told them what it is that we're, we have this in for? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, no, we know better and you only get this much. It sounds kind of you know, This unusual. has been an ongoing practice for years, Mr. Anderson. And as a county commissioner, former county commissioner, you should know that they can refuse yeah, line items. But, Typically, they don't. Well, this last is... Last year, two million oh, came yeah. off of this. Yeah, yeah, last year, two million. And Canada, several years didn't. ago, my first year on the board, I they pick and choose the what they I paid for. Yeah. <laughs> they have line item control over the capital so, budget. This is this is an ongoing practice, sir. And then with all of that, Dr. Kane, I'll leave you to summarize. Uh, I mean, so, you know, we always talk about status quo. And at this point, we are less than status quo with the need to find almost $2 million dollars and most likely have to cut some teaching positions or compensation or something furlough. So that puts us even um, at a greater disadvantage than we currently sit right now. So we are less than status quo. And so we just wanted to share with you um, some of the information that we've gotten, an idea of some scenarios that we um, are going to have to take some um, good hard looks at and, and some some options for ways. And, and we have to remember as we go through the process, and, and, and again, we don't know, this is what we saw. We don't know if, you know, recent events are going to prompt some change in this budget. Right, so we don't know that. Um, but what we do have to be mindful of is if we are funded at maintenance of effort, you know, 5,000 here, 10,000 there is not going to get it. We are looking at a large sum of money and to spend time, you know, nitpicking five and 10 and, and $3,000 is gonna take a lot of time. We have to focus on 1.9, um, just about that we've gotta find. So. We've got some time to think about it, and um, we just wanted to make sure that you were, um, you know, thinking in these terms. 
Let me ask you a question. We have yes. copies of all of this. Yes. Of all Mr. Anderson's thing, Sid, do you feel they understand what our needs are? And I mean, when they reduce some of this stuff, have they been in contact with you or anybody or Dr. Kane to understand it? I, nothing we put in wasn't needed, but what is a priority that uh, are they working a little bit with us to make sure yes. they, because I mean, yes, like Mark said, we have trouble understanding it. Sure. And if they're farther away from us, even though they have different issues, I just want to make sure we do the best job and have good communication between everybody. And, and I think this year has been particularly um, smooth in working with our commissioners. They do have an understanding of what our needs are. While I have not yet presented the FY21 budget request to them, we are, as you know, in ongoing conversations. And, um, and, and, I, and I do feel very confident that they do understand. They certainly know the structure. We've not changed any of that. Um, so with our new requests, perhaps not. Um, although our budget request has been up on our website, they, they probably have looked at it. But I, know, but, but to the I late, think that they have an understanding, you know, yes. I think the average person knows what this board goes through or what the commissioners go through to try to keep the tax rate and balance a budget and keep the services up to where they need to be. You know, and I just want people to, you know, there is good communication and we're working with these uh, gentlemen and they're working with us for the best interest of Queen Anne's County, which, you know, we're representing our students. And, you know, there's things we need, there's things that wear out, um, and there's a lot of things we have to look at. Nothing's off the table. And that's everyone. This when is all the, the LEAs. Next, when is the next meeting with them? Next week, I will, on the 28th, I will present our Could budget request. Some of us be there. Some of us will be there. Um, at, at this time, the county commissioners will only allow one person in the room with them at a time to do the presentations. Everyone else has to be out in the hallways for the social distancing. Um, Mr. Smith will be joining Dr. Kane next Tuesday. Uh, I don't know that it requires everybody to be there. Sorry, uh, my daughter is defending yeah. her MAT. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> and the, Dr. Kane, if, I'm, if I may, we sort of breeze through these slides to play to catch up, but I just, the, the gravity of the situation, and, and Mr. Smith, I don't know if you remember, but when we were doing the budget presentation, this was one of the slides that you asked a question about, and you said, well, it looks like our salary and benefit number had gone down. And I had mentioned that, you know, when we get down to it, when we start making the cuts, which is this re reflection here, I just want to kind of put it that even though we're cutting 24 positions out of this scenario, the percentage of our budget that went that goes to salaries and benefits is rising. Well, I mean, I and and, and so what that means is we constantly, and we should take care of the employees. We constantly are putting our funding in the employees and less in the supportive services, which is where we find ourselves into the bind of transportation and special ed. And this is just a very, to me, a, a nice graphic that kind of alludes to that as we continue not being fully funded, that more money will go into salary and benefits and less into the support of services. Oh, I, Even I, by cutting 27 positions that went up. So is well, it possible I understand that when you have to you say you're going to categorize not, when we propose fully funding our Wait, Mr. Anderson, agreement. just a moment, please. You know, that's well over, you know, $3 million when mm -hmm. you figure everything. Mm -hmm. And we're only cutting a million nine out of staff. There's, I mean, yeah, we're, we're heading north. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, could we categorize or split up the salary activity by teachers, janitors, uh, etc. Yes, I have that. Yeah, because <clears throat> one of the things that gets my attention is the loss of over $500,000 if we don't give the teachers 3%. And it isn't just 3% for the starting, it's all the way across it's the It's an aggregate, correct. For all the teachers. So I need to see what that looks like. Okay. And then what is in the budget for the other groups of people. Okay, certainly, I have that. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Fister. Mm -hmm. okay. We now have the COVID-19 uh, updates. Uh, Mr. I, I have uh, hand wipes if you want. Oh, that would be great, thank you. Oh, there's some here, Ms. Hart. Okay. Thank you. 
Does everyone have their packet? Okay. Ready? Why well, it's not in? Is that okay if we do it? It's in PDF. That's that's First, fine. That's I'm, okay. I'm, okay. Do, do you need? Do you need anything? No, I'm fine. Okay. Fine. All right. So, uh, first of all, for the record, um, Gregory Paluski. Deputy Superintendent Andrea Kane, Superintendent. The purpose of today, uh, today's presentation is to share some updates to our district plans uh, that are supporting um, students and families and certainly our employees during our extended school closure for COVID-19. Of course, uh, last week everybody learned that um, Dr. Salmon, she extended the school closure through May 15th. And so we will be closed at least that long. We're not sure after that. We had a conversation with her today and she did not indicate that she had any um, idea how long it would be or if it would be longer just to May 15th. We continue to send out communication to all of our stakeholders. We continue to be in communication on a weekly basis with uh, MSDE and Dr. Salmon, our, uh, our, my colleagues around the state with superintendents, um, also with the health department. And thank you to Mrs. Morissette, who also is a part of those calls for the COVID-19 um, readiness groups and, and, and um, certainly department heads across the county. So today we're going to give you a couple of updates about the continuity of learning plan. And at this point, I'm just going to let you know that we continue to keep the same structure. So we are looking at phases one, two, and three. We have made some adjustments to some of those phases. Um, phase one stays just as it has been. So there is no change there. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Paluski, uh, who's going to talk about um, phase two and phase three, any changes that we have made there. Mr. Paluski. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Um, for the record again, Greg Paluski, Deputy Superintendent. Um, as, as we continue with our continuity of learning plan, there are constant changes. Um, uh, some of those directly from the Maryland State Department of Education, and I will go through that uh, on some specifics as it relates to district continuity of learning plans. Um, one, we still continue, and really in the second bullet, now that the superintendent had mentioned that uh, we're going to extend our time into May 15th, um, that still continues with uh, our students that don't have access, uh, still printing materials. We're kind of go through another phase of that now to be able to push out uh, information uh, to students uh, as it's requested. Uh, with that, our continuity of learning plans that we expect um, that are on all of our system websites have been up through um, that phase, which will go through Friday. Uh, those will again extend, so our community, our teachers, um, I mean our parents rather, and our community can expect to see from their teachers what they're going to be teaching uh, over the next, period, uh, the next uh, extended school closure period. With that in mind, I'm going to go in. Really, I'm gonna jump from here a little bit forward to specifically into the continuity of learning, um, some of those expectations, if that's okay, Dr. Kane. Uh, with that, um, we're still in our evaluation, really in phase two of this, but we're constantly in a foot in phase three, which is constantly evaluating and adjusting. I'm gonna show you that example um, in a minute. One of the things um, that we have done last week uh, is that we implemented our Tiger teams, which are targeted immediate group execution and response teams. Uh, you should uh, be a little bit familiar with this because it takes a modified version of our innovation center teams, except these teams uh, are quick hit teams. They're formed pretty quickly for a specific task. And I'm gonna go over what each of those tasks were uh, in order to make a recommendation to the superintendent that we're gonna share with you this evening. Continue to monitor our feedback from our administrators and our teachers as well in order to, again, improve and adjust um, our continuity of learning plan as we move forward. Uh, with that said, oops. So this is, this is a collaborative of like getting information from principals, teachers, and all kinds of providers. So they've got input in, both in, input in yeah. how it's affecting them and what they see on the ground. I, Absolutely, um, Mr. Smith, and you're going to see today that some of the recommendations that are made um, from those Tiger teams have had input um, uh, from teachers as well. So you're going to see those, those particular recommendations. 
So uh, what we're going to share with you, Dr. Kane and I are going to share with you, this is more or less an agenda uh, of what you can expect uh, in the next few, so few slides. So I'm going to go over with you some of the recent uh, changes or requirements from MSDE. We're going to talk about the Tiger Team recommendations. Uh, we're going to give you an update, uh, update on internet access and connectivity, a little bit of uh, the professional development that we have planned and that our teachers continue through, and then uh, the superintendent is going to recommend some proposed calendar changes uh, based upon some of the information that we've received uh, as it relates to extended school closure. Last week in our MSDE assistant superintendent meeting, we were informed um, that all jurisdictions in the state of Maryland have to have in their district continuity of learning plans, these seven essential components, uh, which we'll have to turn in uh, this Friday. Most of these, I would say, generally speaking, uh, we have uh, maybe in different communications and different components, um, but essentially it'll be pulling all those components together into one plan that will be brought, provided to the State Department. Uh, so not to go through this long laundry list, but one, how we're delivering continuity of learning. What are the various roles and responsibilities of various stakeholders within uh, our district? What's a sample teacher day look like? What's a sample student day look like? Those number of minutes that, that we suggested are maximum um, for our teachers. The accountability, which we're gonna talk a little bit about that this evening, that specifically ties in uh, the grading component and some of the changes that are being recommended. Equity from the standpoint of how we're meeting the needs of our special education students, uh, our English language learners, um, as well as our professional development plan. And then they specifically wanted to make sure in our plan that we were communicating uh, what are the vast resources that students have available to them and their parents know that they have available to them as, as we move forward. Uh, as you know, there are resources that, that we receive on a, on a constant basis, but what we'll share here is our, our core resources um, that we'll be able to share, which we've already shared uh, with our parents as well. I have a question on that. Yes, Captain is Kelly. The state, is the state um, approving this or they just wanna see it? Yeah, that's interesting. We had conversation about that. So last week we learned that they wanted to approve and we want, and so, Part of our conversation today was what does approve mean and they have not quite solidified what that would look like so they haven't given you an slo to help no. get all this together no they they just gave us these um components last week last week last uh i believe it was last thursday in my state meeting um i'm sorry friday in my friday. state meeting that they had shared these components uh in a powerpoint um and then our charge is now to take these with some of the plan that we've already had and then basically package this uh, with a little bit more detail uh by friday aren't this you friday. glad you got a lot of time for this Yes. Uh, okay. We're should we wait till this is over? Sleep or fast. Or should we have comments in we the don't, process? It's not, they, this is what they have to do. I mean... And, and, and we'll come back yeah. once, once we have that, once, once we share so these, all these components. The continuity of the presentation of the continuity of the learning. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, I would ask questions if you have them based on it, like I just did. This is something we have to do. So, and, and, have to do and as to, to your point, Captain Kelly, uh, as we continue with our board meetings, uh, COVID-19 updates are gonna be continual. So uh, I would imagine the superintendent will want, once we put this plan together, to come back to you and the public and share uh, these essential components. Okay. Uh, right now, our draft stands at about 20 pages. So, uh, but we'll have that done by Friday. Oops. Tiger teams. Sure, so our, uh, I don't know if you wanna take that, Dr. Kane or, or myself. Go ahead or, and I'll start with the first yeah, Tiger so, Team. Um, so as I mentioned, Tiger Teams are a form of project management, mean project management team, similar that we have cross-functional teams like the Innovation Center. Historically, uh, it was a military term used by NASA. Uh, they were actually the first Tiger Teams that actually solved uh, the Apollo 13 landing. Uh, so that's the historical piece of it. So we have six Tiger Teams. Uh, our first Tiger team was to, uh, their task was to look at graduation exercises and senior activities. Uh, our two project managers there are our two high school principals, and we're gonna share with you their recommendation. Tiger Two team, which is led by our academic deans at each of our high school uh, that are int intimately involved in grading. Uh, they were tasked with looking at uh, our current grading policy and to be able to take a look at, as we move forward, make recommendations um, uh, to grading and reporting as we move forward 
forward in our fourth uh, marking period. The same thing with Tiger Team 3, led by two of our principals uh, and made up of our principals, uh, our middle school principals and, and some of our supervisors, they were tasked with the same, uh, to look at our middle school grading policy, make some recommendations based upon the changes and the impact uh, of COVID-19. Same thing with Tiger Team 4, led by two of our elementary principals and made up of our elementary principals to offer the same thing. Look at our policy, look at practice, what recommendations do we need to make forward. Uh, Tiger Team 5, which is led by um, Mr. Kintop at Arise Academy and uh, Mrs. Dubois, who uh, is our facilitator of the Virtual Learning Academy, is to look at really recovery education. And Dr. Kane and I will share with you uh, some of their recommendations as we think about moving into the summer and continuing uh, with learning and especially with some gaps in some learning, as well as what summer school and then potentially what, um, how do we prepare for the upcoming school year. And then Tiger Team 6, again, to look at the needs of our special education students, our English learners and to be able to make any recommendations that they saw fit to the to the superintendent so our first tiger team and before i even say i would i just want to give some kudos and accolades to all of the folks that all of our staff members that to work so hard and in a short amount of time to uh, bring us some recommendations. I'd also like to let everybody know that some of these recommendations we need to act on sooner than later. Um, I'm starting with the graduation and senior uh, exercises and senior activities from Tiger Team One, but want to say that this is not one that is, we're going to uh, enact immediately. Um, we are still getting feedback from some stakeholders, most notably our students. So our principals of the high schools led these groups along with the, they uh, pulled in several other staff people and they had some conversation with some of the students but there's a lot more our own student board members are very very interested in sharing um, information that they have gotten from their peers and so that will certainly happen and I and I've gotten some emails from some parents as well so we'll we'll make sure that we include everybody's input but the recommendations from Tiger Team 1 are as follows senior prom the recommendation is to cancel that and I am certain that part of that has to do with the fact that we continue to push back those school closures and the closer we get to the end of the year the more and I first of all I can't imagine that we're going to start school again before June but if that does happen we're at a, a real deficit if we try to scramble and pull some things together because I don't expect that we'll be able to have more than 10 in a room or anywhere close to that. So the recommendation is to cancel senior prom at this point. They came up with some ideas for commencement ceremonies and, and the main idea is for a pre-recorded ceremony. And the thinking behind that is for every person who would have had a speech uh, to record that ahead of time, including um, students and board members, myself, anybody who would have had to have a speech to re record that. It would be presented virtually, obviously. They wanted to stick with a date that we already had a graduation scheduled for. And so they thought about May 28th and both schools, if this is what we went with, both schools would have that graduation, that pre-recorded graduation um, aired on that same day. So they were thinking that um, we would, and I'll just paint a picture and I'm sort of gonna combine several of these, these the last two points together. The thinking is that as the um, counselor or principal reads the student's name and all of the accolades, the awards, the scholarships, and all the things that would have been um, recognized for our students at senior awards night, that would be shown with that student's picture underneath of that student's picture. So if they were part of various honor societies, if they won, uh, you know, $500,000 in scholarships, all of those kinds of things would be shown underneath of that student's name and read aloud as that student's name is presented on the screen. So that sort of combines the senior award night with the commencement ceremony. Now, as far as the valedictorian and salut salutatorian um, is concerned, the principals will be contacting those students around the end of May. We're gonna have banners around the community, do big public announcements um, so that everybody knows this is the Val and the Sal. There will be um, opportunities for the Val and Sal to have their recorded message 
embedded in that graduation ceremony that would be aired. So these were some of the, the thinking, some of the thinking around what we might be able to do for um, the graduation exercises. And I know everybody is very, very anxious and wants to know, you know, are we gonna recognize our students? Well, certainly we are, but there's more input that needs to, to be added to this. But this is where we are at this point. Dr. Kane, we're, we're gonna be on Q8 TV7. Will it also be on, like we are tonight, YouTube? So a, a wider variety Absolutely. of people. We generally are. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, because some people don't get cable. Yeah, and I'm then, one of those. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, so anybody could get onto it and watch yes. it. Yes, yes. Will there be a way maybe the, at, at, I don't know, if our cost or their cost, a disc or something, it could be made and, you know, if anybody wanted one, they could have one or something or... Um, usually if it's on on YouTube, I mean you can do what you need to do okay. at, from home. Gotcha. You know to save it and don't even need a, a disc. I'm old school. Mm -hmm. Question? Yes. Uh, the senior prom being canceled, a number of I guess organized groups uh, solicited money from nonprofits to ha ha rent a place and a festive idea. Now we're not going to have it. Who's going to collect the money back? So um, senior proms, this, the class um, keeps control of the funds that they collect. And some of the thinking is that they would be encouraged to use those funds for a gathering when they can gather later next year. So they can do what they want to do with those funds. But that was some of the thinking around that. Okay, next slide. Talk about the gowns distribution. Right, next slide is, um, is for the gowns. And so senior items, the cap and gown distribution, and I believe that these, um, this information was shared with students today. They were very anxious to make sure that students had this because they wanted to, they wanted to know what was gonna happen. So we'll, the thinking is to have students come back to the school and they'll come up with a date in the next few weeks. Jostens is the group that's gonna work with our schools to do this. Um, they're the ring people and the yearbook people. And the idea is students and their families will drive through in their car, sort of like we did when we were distributing the devices at the elementary schools, they'll drive through. We will have them to receive their cap and their gown. They, at that same time, will stay in their car. And if there's a balance due or anything like that, they pay that at the same time. So they drive through, they get their um, materials, and then they drive on um, off the school grounds. Could we also uh, think about, a, uh, we had a parent who came up with a great idea about having a parade. A car parade. A car parade mm -hmm. with the students in it. And maybe, I mean, have them stop and have Jostens take pictures for them in their cap and gown. I mean, it's something to consider just to throw it out there. And yeah. they talked about having, at that point, having their diplomas handed to them in a picture. Remember that? You saw that one. That was a, a thorough, um, I don't know if those parents or anyone in that group has been involved with some of the discussion with Mr. I've Sharkin. seen a lot of emails. I'm not yeah, sure. There's a lot. There's quite a no, few. I'm talking about the yeah. one with the, the drive-thrus. That, yeah. that was the only one that talked about graduation, the graduation so ceremony. That and the, and the, right. the hardcover. So you yep, I, can, you I can certainly... You know, I've sent everything that I have to both principals. Okay. Um, I do have a number of emails today that I haven't gotten to, sure. but whatever I get, I make sure I send it to principals so okay. that they have it because they're working on it. Yeah, because okay. you've always said, answered them that you're you're going to take that into consideration. So just I send that to the group that's handling it. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Okay. Just like I said last week, I won't be making, or last time, I will not be making any independent decisions. This is recommendations from um, So from the principals are, are taking it. care of this? Absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. this is, that's not anything that we would decide on as a no. board that's strictly then. We're mo now we're moving into things that we decide on. Okay. Mm. Let's keep going. Okay. Mr. P is going to talk about grading at each of the um, levels, high school, middle school, elementary school, and we have a few other things that we'll talk about. Mr. P? Sure. So this is uh, Tiger Team 2. This is their recommendation that was led by both 
uh, Ms. Ken and Ms. Rankin are academic uh, deans. And uh, so let me just share with you a little bit, uh, probably it's a good place to start of how we currently grade in high school. And then I'll back map from that of where the recommendations are. Uh, so currently uh, we're very unique in, in our grading, especially within between quarters, between third and fourth uh, as a semester. So as a student uh, gets, let's just say the student has a C, um, at the end of the third marking period. In a traditional sense, that C slides to begin the fourth quarter and then they, they continue. So it's really a sliding grade, it's not a standalone grade. And I'll talk about that and some of the difference uh, within middle school. So with that in mind, uh, currently our, our high school teachers uh, grade um, our high school students uh, on a variety of factors. Uh, number one, uh, all of our students required to have a final exam, uh, 40, uh, percent of a student's grade is a mastery assessment. Uh, there's some flexibility in the progress assessments, meaning 30 or 40 percent um, is factored into that. And then homework can be anywhere from zero to 10 percent, which is all completely factored into the student's grade to come up with a final grade that goes on the child's transcript. So uh, the first recommendation uh, that the committee believes in, and, and we do as well, is that should, students should still receive grades. Uh, and they should go on their transcript. However, there's a couple caveats to that because uh, of how we're actually grading students. Uh, so the recommendation by this Tiger team is number one, um, to waive final exams uh, that are 15% of the student's grade. Uh, their second recommendation is to waive mastery assessments. So I can go over those two things really quickly, some rationale behind that. Number one, we have hundreds of courses that have final exam grades. Um, number one, those have to be secured. We currently do not have a system in place that we can assure any security of those assessments. Uh, but more importantly, anytime we administer assessment, whether it's a local assessment or, or a national assessment, we have to ensure that the students have been exposed to all the standards that are being tested. Same would roughly apply to the mastery assessments. Um, the last part of that is their consideration is waiving homework as well. And so therefore, their recommendation um, really in the third and the fourth marking period is that 100% of the student's grade therefore um, goes into progress assessments. Um, and the reason for that is the complexity uh, of the grade book and how the different categories are weighted. So if we just waive final exam, we just waive mastery, there's still flexibility in homework to have zero to 10. Um, so their recommendation is to have consistency across both of our schools um, and eliminate those categories and only have progress assessments that count for 100%. Now that would include the third quarter as well as the fourth quarter. Uh, so our direction to schools uh, as we started with COVID-19 as March 13th was to do no harm. So whatever that student's grade was, so if that was a C, you weren't gonna go below a C. Um, so with this, uh, this kind of recalculation, um, just give me one second, uh, Mr. Anderson, um, then allows for those grades to be all progress assessment grades. So in the event in that recalculation, if there is uh, any negative impact, that simply will go in the grade book um, as an exempt. So it will not count towards that student or negatively impact their grade moving forward. Yes, Mr. Anderson, or you want me to? The grade for the third quarter also had two preceding quarters. No, not within not the, within our because no, we're in a semesterized we're accumulating. We're in a semester, it and well, I, then I don't understand what we're doing. So we're 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 in a semesterized schedule. So when I talk about uh, middle school here in a second, um, we have four marking periods. So in middle school just as we're probably, we're traditionally all have had gone through a grading system where you get a grade for the first, then you get a grade for the second, you get a grade for the third, and you get a grade for the fourth, and all of those are averaged together. That's currently our middle school, which, which probably most of us, when we went to high school, probably had a similar okay. grading system. This, because we're on a semesterized, um, if, if the student has a 70 at the end, I'm just using that as an example, at the end of the third quarter, um, it's not a reset for a whole new grade coming into the fourth quarter. That 70 slides into the fourth quarter and that student continues with that grade. It's not a standalone grade. And they can and, also improve on that grade. Ab absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And that's what you're gonna see here um, is, is allowing students that opportunity going forward that can enhance their grade moving forward. Yes. So in most cases, Mr. Anderson, 
the first and second marking period, that's one semester, that's a whole totally different class. So that's done with. That's why we aren't saying average first, second, third, fourth. So when I see history, world history, that goes through the whole year, it has components. And so we're, they're, they're graded on the components and it slides. So some, some classes are year long, but most of the classes are semester. So if you, let's just use algebra one. If you did algebra one first semester, nine times out of 10, you're done with algebra one by this time of the year. You've got another class for second semester. So if somebody has a C uh, by the, when school stopped, mm -hmm. then we're saying that their grade at the end of the school year will not be less than a C, but it can be higher Correct. based on these criteria that have just been explained. I think that's not true though, because so, well, in, if you eliminate all the masteries, then every mastery they did third quarter is eliminated. And what if they worked really hard, had trouble with the progressives, and then went to the mastery for the grade? And sure. they, I mean, I don't sure. know and why they're eliminating the masteries that have already been done. Because the the way that the grade book is set up, it's all those categories are weighted differently. So um, if if we allowed that, and actually this was the recommendation by the teachers that came to the academic deans, is that. If, if we kept homework as an example, then you know Dr. Kane might say her class is worth you know 10% of the grade. Mrs. Harper is only 2% of the grade, and now we've got just a, equity. It, we do, and the way that it's it's balanced. So their recommendation is really that really sets it across for all grade levels, and then again, to your point, which is. Uh, even with the mastery assessment removed from that, um, if there's any negative impact. Uh, below that May, I'm sorry, that March 13th date, that will be an exempt that goes in the gray book. That way it's not gonna negatively impact that student. Um, and then, you know, now that we look forward and there's all these opportunities for students um, to be able to increase their grade, we also have to look at a couple different scenarios. So I, I, my guess is the vast majority of students are gonna wanna take their grade because they're engaged with their, their teacher, they're, they're turning in assignments, and rightfully so. If, if I had a C and I've worked fairly hard and I got a B um, and I've been able to prove that, absolutely, we should award that, that child that letter of a B and that should go on their transcript. Let's talk about a couple other different. Oh, I have a, I, I'm not clear on this now. So if someone has ended their third quarter. Yes. And say they have a 4-0. Say they have a 4-0. If you pop out the masteries and their grade ends up going down to a 3-0, you're not going to make it. So no, so no, so, so it won't negatively impact. So if, if a teacher does sees that and they see that, in those categories that, that had that weight, they would put exempt in the grade book. When you put exempt, which is almost like a blank, it's not gonna calculate that. So it should keep the grade where it is. And then going forward, anything that the child does, turns into assignments, continues to be part of that student's grade as they move forward. Let's talk about a couple, and here's, here's some important things because I know this is a national, really national or a state, when we're talking about uh, the marker of a P, which is pass, or the marker of an I, which is incomplete. Which is on so, the next page. So, yep, and I'll move right into that and then we can I talk about it. a quick comment, I guess. Sure. As a parent of a child who has A's, what's my incentive for encouraging him to keep doing the work if he's gonna finish with an A? Because um, I want him to stay on his skills. But if he's telling me, mom, they're not grading it anyway, or it's not gonna count. Well, well, they are gonna get a grade, right? So, so going forward, so, so let's go into, the, I'm gonna go into that scenario in a minute. Um, because they are expected to, to continue with their learning. They're continuing to be communicating with their teacher and they're mm -hmm. expected to be continuing to turn in assignments. And at home he's expected to continue. Absolutely, <laughs> and, and we applaud our parents that are balancing I home think. life, uh, as we all know, and they're trying to keep, certainly for high school students that are more a little bit independent. But, but let's talk about two specific scenarios, one, one that deals with that um, and, and the other one deals with, let's look potentially at a student um, that was failing in, in the third quarter. Um, so as they move into the fourth quarter, um, and as they're trying, uh, hopefully, and, and moving forward and engaging, um, 
uh, it might be in that child's best interest to be able to speak with that principal and say, you know what, I ended up with a D here, which is passing and I'm gonna get credit, uh, but maybe given my circumstance, um, I would like to appeal to have a pass as my final grade. So what does a pass mean? A pass means simply that's the marker that goes on your transcript and you get credit. You get no grade that gets calculated into your GPA. So it's credit not calculated into GPA. So the, pa the pass code and the I code are currently in um, our grading regulation. Our principals use these. We kind of outlined that here. Um, sometimes you'll see um, where there's students that are coming from maybe a, a private school or a homeschool situation and they're coming in and haven't been exposed, we can use credit by exam. Um, but where there's specific language in here that really ties into where we are with COVID-19 is under extenuating, extreme, ex, extenuating. Exten, excuse me, extenuating circumstances. So in that case, um, there might be the child that ends up getting the P that doesn't have the impact on, on their GPA. Now let's take a different scenario. Let's take, let's take the student that has the A or the B, and, and they know that we've communicated no harm, no foul, right? If your grade's not gonna go backwards, uh, it, it should remain in its same. But let's say that child is not communication with his teacher. Let's say that, commun that, that child is not turning in any assignments. Um, one we've told, and, and which is happening, is that we told our principals and, and our teachers are informing their principals if um, little Greg is not engaging at all. And our principals have a really good handle on this right now. The principal has at their authority, if they know that student's not engaging, they can award that student an I, which is basically meaning incomplete until requirements have been met. So in that case, if I have an I, whether I'm a student, um, uh, that may have been in danger of, of failing, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I did not um, pass uh, in the third and I'm working on that. And the principal feels, you know what, you need a little bit more time. We're gonna extend that time through the summer. Uh, so certainly for our seniors, if, they, if they're not making a graduation requirement, and we're gonna talk about our recovery plan in here a minute, in a minute, they're gonna have an opportunity for, for a few weeks to catch up on that. And then they're gonna have an opportunity to go in into summer school. And I don't wanna go through that now because we have, we have um, some strategies that we're gonna share with you. However, uh, the- So it's incentive. It, it is incentive. Um, and the other recommendation uh, from this Tiger team was to allow students to turn that I either into a grade or into a pass so they're not negatively affected all the way up until the middle of October. Now the middle of October is about the midterm point of the first semester. So that's a lot of opportunity, that's a lot of time. And, and what I appreciated about this Tiger team is they're trying to look at the complexity of this, they're trying to provide flexibility, they're trying to make sure that it's fair for all students and make sure that we're not leaving no child behind and that there's, there's lots of different opportunities. Um, you might have a student and I will tell you that I've heard from teachers, I've heard from parents, um, there are some heart-wrenching stories out there. Uh, there are students that are taking on another job, a second job, because uh, one of their parents ha have lost their job. There are parents, there are students right now that are going homeless, unfortunately, because of the situation. So let's say I'm a student that has a B, but I have to take on another job. Uh, I might have some unique circumstances and my grade's starting to fall behind. I might say to, to the principal, can I take a P for that? Because it's not gonna impact my GPA, but I'm gonna get credit. And so I applaud this team because they looked at this from a lot of different factors, from the grade book to looking at what's fair, um, to be able to make a recommendation to um, the superintendent. And then I'll just, let me go into the next one and then we can talk about okay. um, I, I specific question. questions. Yes, Captain. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yep, so, so really the last thing here is, is what I mentioned. So what is the, there's no policy implication to this in our high school grading policy, but there is a regulation uh, to our high school grading policy that is, that is an implication. And that is simply that. So what do they've recommended to the superintendent that has under her purview, waive the final exam, waive the mastery assessments, waive uh, the homework, and then therefore 100% uh, of a student's grade would be in the progress category only in this event of, of the pandemic continuity of learning, and then we would resume and going we, into next year. We can add this depending. to the regulation, correct? I'm sorry? You can add that I to can the waive it. Mm -hmm. Okay, but mm -hmm. you can add that to the regulation to? 
I don't think that we want to add this to the regulation. We want to waive. Okay. This is in the okay. regulation, and so I want to waive okay. this. What is, is it, what is in the regulation? I missed that. It's right here. Yeah, it's, it's your second. T and the I. It's yeah. in, it's oh, in is that on the next yes. page? Does that require, so, with, does that require a board vote? It, it, it does not. Because it's a regulation. That is correct. Thank you. That is correct. That's so we've know. gone through the policy as well as the committee did, and there's nothing in the policy that the board approves that really impacts this. It's really in, um, it's in the regulation. In fact, um, in section I, really B subsection, which is grading, which talks about having to have a final exam. Okay. Um, when you get into page two, you're really talking about a local waiver, which is setting up the different categories and defining the different categories so um, the, and how they're weighted. So the superintendent will just have to write a letter to that extent to the board stating that this is what she's going to do? I, 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 actually, I, it, I'm happy to do that. Okay. No, no, no. I'm just asking to cover our for MSDE. What I would be doing is I would put that with our continuity of learning. There we go. And correct. And I we just want to have, I want to have, make and sure it would really be, it writing. would be an addendum, if you will, okay. um, to our current regulation that would only be in effect for the remainder of this year. And then we would go back again for the upcoming school year uh, into our current policy. Now, if, if we go forward, um, and we have to be in the state that we're in now, that will certainly have to be something that we will look at. Um, and then, you know, we would bring that again forward to <coughs> the board to um, let you know what the superintendent is, is recommending based upon Tiger Teams. Yes, sir. Who uh, is looking out for <coughs> adverse impact to disadvantaged families, uh, Spanish speaking, to make sure that while this is going on, somehow uh, some people get overlooked or is there some calculation uh, that extra time has to be spent with those individuals, their families, their children? Well, so thank you, sir. See, I think this is all coming up. Oh, it's all coming uh, up. Uh, there is a piece in, in, in special education, but, but I can assure you that, you know, we're constantly speaking with, with our administrators and uh, not only one, do they know all their students, uh, but they know the students that they're concerned about um, uh, very much. And, and they're doing everything that they can. Um, their staffs are reaching out, making phone calls. You know, if they haven't heard from a student, uh, everything from literally be, probably beating down their door to make sure that, that that student is okay. But there's a... That I uh, actually should have been making is uh, the much larger school system that borders us in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. Their board voted five to four to do something. And the four who were against it raised a disparate treatment and the Anne Arundel County uh, uh, NAACP agreed with them. So we're going to have some overlooking and I just want to make sure that we're prepared to very quickly and simply indicate what we've done and there is no adverse impact uh, just to make sure that that gets covered. So we have, um, you know, and the superintendent has articulated very clearly uh, our philosophy, which is do no harm uh, to any student, especially with their grade. That's so, wonderful, but some people define harm differently than other people. Well, we I just need to have the statistics. I think that we are covered. Um, we're covered, and and, and without re without repeating what Mr. P just said, so that if you are a student that has a high grade and you want to keep that high grade and continue to build on that, you're good. But if you're a student who is on the borderline, you actually get to petition. If you don't like the grade, and and there were some extenuating circumstances in your family and your life that prevented you from spending the time on your studies that you normally would have, there's a way for you to go to your principal and say, I will take the P instead of the grade. I think that we have, this team did an outstanding job in covering all of the bases. I don't disagree with that. And I know that our board and the people who have put this together, all these Tiger teams are absolutely going to do the best that they can. But that's not who's going to be looking at this. I think that the situation, no, I don't think I know. The situation that we have is different from what's happening across the water. I think so. It is absolutely different. So we have been able to so. account for those pockets of students that are of concern across the water. All right. It doesn't hurt to be a devil's advocate. 
It, it doesn't because it, we have, there's things that somebody might see and not see. I see on social media all the time, my, my child's not doing the work. They're not grading it anyway. So the students who are in jeopardy, I get, is the school targeting in on those kids? Like, I know you got an A last semester, but why aren't you tuning in and, and turning in? Correct, and, and, and that's where we talk about accountability. And, and that's where if the child's not doing anything and, and the teacher's seeing that, you know, uh, little Greg had an A, but I, he's not turning anything in. Absolutely. That's where the I comes in. So it's not an automatic that you, yes, you, you earned that A, that's correct. But if you're not engaging, then that principal, you absolutely. And then you're going to have to extend through the summer. You have all the way now into October. So it is much to your benefit to do it now than it is to say, I'm, I'm going to hold off on that. I have time because now we're going to start another school year. And now you got more courses. So um, that's really, and, and I applaud the Tiger team for that mm -hmm. because they thought about that. They thought about the kid that, the high school kid that might not be engaging. Um, and then how do we have some uh, accountability that says, you're going to have to be doing some stuff um, if, if you want your grade um, to remain the way that it is. That, that word has to be spread though, because the kids are convinced. I mean, well, sure they are. Sure, sure they are. So this work is we're presenting it to you okay. for the first time. So these Tiger teams presented to us yesterday afternoon. They've done some work. And so, yeah, the word will get put out there and there'll be some reckoning. <laughs> yes. I have a question. How many in, in, in line of what Mr. Anderson was saying, I've been reading all about that, too. How many in Queen Anne's County have students have not been reached and are not doing well, generally, yeah. we're here. I'm hearing 10 percent in Anne Arundel. I'm hearing 25 percent okay. in one of the can other I, counties. Can I just interject here? Point of order. Let us get through this first before we. And some of that is in the slides. It's, it's, it's down. Oh, it is. Okay. Yes. Right. Can we please? I just haven't seen the get, slide. No, we all have it. This is a first chance. Yep. So and there's a reason for that because we didn't want folks to get in front of you before we yes. had an opportunity so let's, to present we, this. Thank sure. you, sir. Yes, so we're at uh, middle school now. Yep. I'll keep it going. Uh, we so ask, we ask high school questions later. Is that what you're saying? I have a more high school question. If you want to do those later, I'm okay with that. Let's let's get through the presentation okay. if we could. Uh, so middle school is a little bit differently, kind of as, as I was alluding to. Uh, that has, we have uh, semesterized courses and year-long courses, but traditionally that is in um, four quarters. Um, so the four quarters get averaged uh, to make up a student's final grade. So the middle school grading team, um, so let me backtrack there for a second. So with that, that's how we're currently graded. Um, their grades are based 50-50, 50% on mastery assessments, 50% on progress assessments. Um, so as, the, as we're in the fourth quarter, um, their recommendation is that only um, grades that go into the fourth quarter are, are at the 80% or above level. Uh, and what that means is that if I turn in an assignment and it's not at 80%, I have multiple opportunities to turn that assignment in in order to get that 80%. So if the work's not at standard, there, you know, middle school's a different philosophy, but giving kids multiple opportunities to get feedback from their teacher in order to reach that maximum of an 80% or higher um, if a student chooses to do that. So all quarter four assignments um, then would be categorized as progress assessments. Uh, and I'll talk about that as a, as a recommendation, um, which is a change in the regulation as well. Um, certainly similar in a sense uh, to our high school principals. Uh, our middle school, school principals do have the flexibility um, to waive the fourth quarter entirely. Um, and, and if for some reason there was a negative impact on that fourth quarter grade, um, the middle school principal could award uh, the marker of a P, which is simply passed. That's not a negative impact. It doesn't, it doesn't help, it doesn't harm. Uh, therefore, the, the student's grade would be averaged on the three quarters, the first Q1, Q2, and Q3. Um, if, if they didn't learn what was supposed to be in that component, it's gonna roll forward because the assumption is that the knowledge is now in the student's mind and so they start out in the next grade, but don't have it. 
we're going to talk to you about recovery ed. Okay, mm -hmm. I see part yep. of that. So uh, this, uh, again, just adds, uh, just gives some principles, some flexibility to be able to support students. Uh, and, and the same thing applies if it's a, if a student, you know, that has really had straight A's. Uh, again, it adds some accountability that um, if, if they're not engaging, that, that principal has the authority to leave this blank until that child makes up that work. Uh, in middle school, um, the middle school principals are recommending that they would give students all the way up until the beginning of the next marking, the beginning of the next school year to be able to make up an assignment um, in order to get a grade. And I think, again, that speaks to, you know, allowing students time and flexibility if needed um, in order to um, receive um, their grade. Um, with that said, um, if there's an assignment which is turned in, um, again, within the uh, middle school grading uh, policy, uh, there's an NTI which is not turned in. In this case, it would just be a missing notation. Again, um, in the current policy, an NTI, if that's entered, it automatically goes to a 40%. So that would negatively impact. So if we leave it blank, it will not have a negative impact. Um, so what are the recommendations or the implications for the middle school grading regulation? Again, middle school policy, um, it does not have an impact on this, but um, the waiver for the middle school grading does. Again, as I mentioned, everything would be progress assessments. That would make up 100%. Only those assignments reaching 80% or more would go into the grade book. Uh, section C, which talks about minimum grades, that would be waived. Um, we talked about, you know, no grade would be subject to a lower grade if it wasn't turned in, which is part of the regular uh, grading policy. Uh, the second to the last bullet, which talks about the missing notation, again, the NTI, no negative impact. And really the last part is, is really given that some flexibility uh, to the principal uh, about awarding um, the, the marker of a P uh, at their discretion. Um, and then students will have, again, as we mentioned, until the fall, the beginning of the next school year to be able to turn an assignment. And we'll really connect kind of high school and, and middle school, if you will, when Dr. Kane talks about recovery and what that period of time is gonna look like. I think there's some, actually some really exciting opportunities um, that we have. Middle, middle school okay. students that are taking high school classes, like Algebra One. Algebra One, Spanish One. Whatever. Absolutely. They are gonna be on the level of high school. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Follow the same, so, so follow follow the same, same recommendations of high great. school. Yes, least, sir. Because when they're in eighth grade, they're in ninth grade, they're, they've left the middle school arena. Mm -hmm. So if they're taking high school, they're gonna be on a high school level, even though they're still in middle school with those gradings. Because I mean, if you take Algebra One, and you're not fluent or Correct. habit. They're, they're you're taking lost a, in algebra too. Yes, sir. They're taking a high school course in middle school. And they're so, going to be absolutely, as a high schooler. Same thing would apply okay. um, to the, the recommendation from the high school. That's okay. correct. Yep. That's exactly right. So That's nowhere correct. in this grading process is a numerical grade like 80 and above but below 90 is a B. None of that. Yes. Still, it's, still applies. Absolutely. Oh, okay. uh, so what we're saying here, and that, that, that's a part, you know, that, that's an actual, so I'll go for the high school to second. That's clearly outlined in the high school okay. policy. Those, those things won't change. How we determine a letter grade, those things don't change, wouldn't change in um, middle school as well. Good, good question. Some school systems, they are changed. Yeah, well, they would if you were just going with a P and an I, those things would be eliminated, sure. Really, there there are no necessarily um, you know changes at the elementary level. Elementary level, you know, is in three trimesters. Um, their recommendation is just progress carries over from trimester two uh, until trimester three because remember that standards based grading. Many of our standards that they're taught. Um, um, just spiral kind of upward. So they're continuing to work at a deeper level on that, unless it would be content that would be new, then they would um, certainly note that. The progress rubric, so could go anywhere from a zero to a four, uh, will not have a negative impact on a student. Um, again, April 27th to the 15th, they're working on identifying assignments. Um, all of our schools are really creative, especially uh, one we found in best practice, uh, especially if a student has a packet, uh, that they're snapping pictures of that, a family member, a parent, and they're, they're turning that information into the teacher. So that, that has seemed to work. Um, and again, if there's an indicator that is not assessed, this is currently on the trimester as well. Um, it'll be simply utilized with a dash 
and, and that's currently uh, in, in practice right now. Um, one of the things that will probably be the biggest exception uh, or what parents should expect on the, on the elementary progress report is a much larger comment section. There, are, there is a comment section, um, but the, the principals re are recommending um, in their expectations gonna be their teachers, you're gonna see a lot more feedback and comments. Um, again, unified arts. Uh, and essentially what we've said at the elementary level is because elementary teachers teach multiple uh, subjects is focus on reading and math, integrate science and social studies when you can, uh, and work with your unified arts teachers to integrate a few times a week. Um, so it's, it's simply, if it's not assessed, uh, it will be on there, not on there with a dash, science and social studies as the same. Uh, and they'll be sending progress reports uh, out by mail uh, that will be attached uh, with those specific comments. Again, we wanted to be consistent, let you know that there is no impact to the policy um, or um, the regulation moving forward. Let me ask one question with elementary because they're younger kids and are just getting started. Is there any idea about looping maybe where a teacher, since they've lost one quarter of their year, they let that teacher stay with that class for another year? Uh, is there any merit in doing something like that? So they did not recommend that. Um, I know that in certain spots, teachers do that yes. in certain places, but there was not a recommendation. That's such a very individual school um, decision, yeah. Yeah, decision for the principal to make because one, a teacher's got to want to do it to be successful at it. And they have to be able, they have to have that right fit in order to do that, be ready to go to the next grade. And that's a whole nother set of I'm learning like, I, for them. I didn't know if our elementary school teachers were capable of teaching more than one like we certainly second, second, second we, we certainly do have some that do but all of them can't is that what? i'm not gonna say they can't um i think it is been yeah. bonding you they know this they know the students they know where they are they'd be up and running in september or whenever we go back to school mm -hmm. with their same teacher mm -hmm. i'm just thinking would that be helpful um I, I don't know that it would across the board um, we'd have some some concerns about who's doing what and what had would have to happen in terms of professional development because if you're going to loop you're going to a new grade and so you've got to learn a whole new, new content. grade level um, so I think that we are okay what we're doing right now they did not mention that and we certainly have some very very competent um, folks on this team but that's a I, that's a very individual school um, sort of decision and I wouldn't want to say do that because it's not going to work everywhere. Thank you. So our next slide is talking about recovery education. And this one um, is, is a, it's a big um, discussion right now. And I have to say kudos to this group who got this going. So Mr. Dubois and Mr. Kentop led this group and they had certainly some input for up from others. But this is about ensuring, and there's a lot of words on this in that first paragraph, but this is about ensuring that students who have not mastered material during this school closure have an opportunity to do so. And we have lots of examples of start and end dates and all of those kinds of things. We have some examples of grade band um, specific activities and, and learning opportunities that students would have. But in essence, those children that Mr. P just got talk, got finished talking about at the high school level who may have an eye, here is a, yet another opportunity for those students to get what they missed, turn in assignments, and not just for the high school students, but across the board. So you'll see at the bottom of this slide, we move from kindergarten to 12, and then we sort of separate out pre-K to 12, and then we talk about some alternatives. So across the board, every student in Queen Anne's County will have access to recovery education programs. For the most part, we're going to use, or the recommendation is to use, um, it's called Exact Path. It's through the Edmentum platform. That's online courses. So for high school students, it's Edmentum. We've used it for a number of years. We continue to use that. At the K to 8 level, it's called Exact Path. And that is also online learning. So it's modules. What happens is students, when they start, they take a diagnostic assessment and it will, the computer, computer adaptive technology, it sort of looks at the deficits that students have based on that content, that grade level. And it assigns to them certain modules that they need to 
enhance their skills. So if I took this assessment and it said, okay, Andrea Kane, you have missed uh, fractions, adding and subtracting fractions, you've not mastered that, that's part of the fourth grade curriculum, your module's gonna start with adding and subtracting fractions, right? So it is adaptive in that sense and individualized for each student in that sense. The plan is to start students over the summer. We aren't quite sure when we'll have the okay to start programs in the summer, but we're preparing for that first week after school. Um, I'm gonna talk to you in a little bit about um, some recommendations for the calendar, but the recommendations that you'll hear will have us ending school at the same time on June 12th. So the week after that, we'd like to be able to begin um, this education reco or recovery education, any student, all students. But you'll note that I, ha and it's across all content areas. So we've put down here reading language arts, math, science, social studies, CTE, world classical languages, all of that is, is part of that as well as electives. But this team had some specific concern about our youngest learners. So students who are in pre-K to two, you know they are not one to one. Um, and so they felt very strong strongly about creating or sort of purchasing these learning kits. Inside the learning kit is everything that students need to know about a particular subject area with the materials already there. So parents aren't saying, oh my goodness, we have to do a hands-on activity, I gotta go find A, B, C, or D. So what they need would be in the learning kit. And this is for students in pre-K to two. Now, any other student, obviously, that does not have access to technology would certainly have an opportunity to get learning packets and work on projects, just as we've always done since we've been out. Yes, sir. Uh, not to interrupt this, but what are we doing about parental indifference? I'm sorry. Okay, we can't address that issue. Huh? No, I mean, what happens to these? No, I was going to ask the same thing, but parents and students where the parents, the parents aren't, aren't going to work with them on the learning kit. So, good question. So, if they don't work with them on the learning kit, we're going to continue this opportunity throughout all of next school year and into next summer. So, when students come back to school, we'd like to offer the same opportunity so they'd have some guidance from someone at school as well. So, thank you for that. And I think that was what you were asking. Okay, so yeah, so that would that would take care of that. Um, so let's get this straight. Mm -hmm. We had until October for them to f do the IPs, but what you're talking about mastery, you're going to let them have until end of next year. Continue. Thank you. Yep, so this is the recovery part. Okay. This is All the right. part where sure. if I didn't master something, not a missed <laughs> assignment, although okay. it can yeah. cover a missed assignment until a certain period of time. I just want to clarify the difference. Yep. And, and, and we often talk about credit recovery, so if I'm, I need that credit in order to move forward versus maybe unit or, or conceptual concept recovery. Okay. And what Dr. Kane's referring to is I'm missing these two units, so to speak. This helps fill the gap. Not necessarily that I'm moving forward in my next courses, but it's just a, it, it's a gap filler, if you will. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would that be done in separate classes? It's not a class. Kids can work on this at home. Kids can work on this at school. So I would imagine that there would be, there is some time for intervention. So if there is some time for students to work on this during the school day, absolutely, because they all will have access to it. Well, what, I guess what I'm getting at, and I think it's a great idea if somebody's fallen behind, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't want those students heeding other students by not being able to move forward. If that teacher has to spend too much time, do we have another class they can go in to get up to speed? That's our general interventions, yes. If we do have interventions at all of our schools. But just to clarify, this can be used because all students have access to it. This can also be used to enhance skills. Okay. So they, students could get ahead with this. I just, well, I just want to make sure we keep moving. I want, I want everybody on the train, but I don't want the, the boost holding up the engine either. Yep. So this this is this is one way that we hope to uh, to bridge that free? gap. Is it going to be free? free for every every person. Free for every person. Mm -hmm. Yep. For all of our students. So a, a great deal of thought has been put into this, and and really taken into consideration what's best uh, for learning for the youngest learners. I think is is important to note. Now on the next slide, you're gonna see specifically recovery education as it pertains to summer school. So we're gonna to continue to do our summer school just as we've always done. Um, summer school is six, 
uh, 16 days, it's two hours, 45 minutes, all of those things are the same for summer school. We are, uh, we've sort of given a tentative date, start date of July 6th. And the reason is because if a student wanted to start with that recovery ed piece in the beginning of the summer, they could still go to a summer school program in July and work throughout the month of July because recall that our summer school for high school students is online and, and that would continue. So this would really um, uh, move right up against and flow right along with the recovery education piece and they could move right into summer school. And they're gonna be charged for that. There is a fee for that. There, there is a fee for summer school. Mm -hmm. so that was gonna be my question. The kids, no matter what grade, who need who did not participate and now they've got the summer to try to tune back in, what's the impact on our teachers for that? Yeah. Because this teacher's keeping the grade book for this child, but you've got hundreds of kids over the school system. Who's keeping track of those missed assignments? Well, the teacher is keep aren't working through the summer. Right. The teacher is keeping track of the missed assignments. Um, this recovery ed program, this is self-contained, if you will. So it is all part of that. Teachers aren't grading that work. It is. A, it's just. A, it's a computer program. So once you've mastered it, then you move to the next section and you move to. So this doesn't require a teacher to have a grade book and and all of those kinds of things. That's not what this does. Did this I keeps that, that teacher from trying to catch those assignments to turn in a grade before the beginning of the next year. Correct. Week. Now, it will be monitored for okay. certain. This, this program is definitely monitored. And we're hoping that some, if we, if we needed some additional funding, that some of the funding that we get from these CARES dollars will help to cover that because this is one of the main focuses for those CARES dollars. So that this seems... packet's going to be able to go to all the students but will there be things like if a parent needs some help or, you know, the parents are probably should be the best barometer of what the children are doing. Will it be available for them to call somebody in their school and say, here's where I think my students, you know, needs help. I, can I get some extra learning or something for them to work over the summer? Yeah, so generally with these programs, there is support within the program. So they demonstrate whatever the lesson is. You're looking at it, you know, virtually, and there's a demonstration, and you can go back and go back and go back for the demonstration. Now, particularly, I can certainly have this group to sort of front load what the parent resources are for this. So when we roll it out, then the parents know what the resources are, where they can go and get help. And, and it'd, be, it'd be all anybody could you do that? Be open to everybody. Yep, every okay. student. That's a good idea. Okay, special ed. And for special education, this information has been widely available. Uh, we just sort of broke it up into three different areas, instructional delivery, just like students who are in the general ed population, students are getting their lessons online and they're also, you know, if they needed it, they get them in learning packets. We have had um, each student has a sort of a distance learning, con um, continuity of learning plan, and it is geared toward their individual need. If they have a learning packet, hard copy that's geared toward their individual need and we'll continue that um, case management happens by phone calls video conferencing as do IEP meetings at this point based on the parents preference and we are meeting with all of our parents and contacting them you know our students stay in contact with them um, on a regular basis at least weekly and uh, have had a lot of support in doing that so what we'll do when school does finally reopen we will have um, scheduled IEP meetings and and if there is a need to change the services or to uh, sort of regroup in the services, then that will happen, which, you know, by all means, it may result in some compensatory services that need to, to happen. But that is always, um, you know, um, a possibility. Mr. P is going to talk about the Internet access and those options. Yes, just a, just a quick update. So um, we anticipate, it was the last time that we gave the update that we had ordered 100 hotspots. We anticipate those being here on Monday. Uh, so we're in the process to determine uh, the distribution of those. Um, best practice across the state has been ensuring your teachers have internet access first, and then really starting with seniors and moving to juniors, so forth, just because of credit bearing courses. 
Um, our school building, so our outdoor uh, Wi-Fi um, access uh, point, which have been ordered, we expect that delivery to be um, around May 11th, that week of May 11th, and those are targeted at four sites. Each one of those are uh, Title I schools, so that means Graysonville Elementary, Churchill Elementary, and both Southersville Elementary and Middle School um, will be receiving those outdoor kits meaning if you go to that area, you'll be able to connect. Um, and really the third, which has been an outstanding beginning of a partnership uh, with Atlantic Broadband that has reached out uh, to Dr. Kane, um, as well as uh, to the at-large community uh, in Queen Anne's for specifically looking at sites in Queen Anne's County um, in which they can partner to put Wi-Fi so we can spread that access. So a couple uh, ideas right now are the Centerville Business Park uh, near Food Lion and the Stevensville um, Food Lion area as well. Um, so beyond our four pilot sites for our outside, we want to partner with them to see if we can add some more uh, of our sites, but also not that we're not duplicating. So we don't want to put one at a high school if there's one going to be one in the in the business park as an idea. Um, so we'll continue to keep you updated on that. But that is uh, Kluski, yes, why don't we have a bus in a going with a hotspot somewhere now? I mean, we, we I mean, we have been this long without it. Why do we got to wait till May 11th? Back ordered. Everybody's everybody. Everything's back. every. It is. It, it is purely amazing on on trying to get a quick turnaround. Everybody wants hotspots. And laptops. It's hard to get a laptop right yeah. now. I laptops and hotspots. Also inform our resource officers just because when somebody drives by and sees twenty cars in a parking lot, you know we know that that's a distant learning facility or just to make sure that. Gary's up on it or whoever resource sure. office is. So <laughs> Mr. Pender and I are on um, a couple calls each week with the rest of the county and they have our, you know, our plan. They know that we're working with Atlantic Broadband and that there will be some, you know, cars in certain places, not just school parking lots, but other places right. in the community because of that internet access. How about Roman Co? Or Ken Island, High, or Ken Island Fire Department. I think that was one that they may have been looking Post, at. Yeah. I was thinking all the way down Route Eight, that firehouse. Mm. That's I don't know that I don't. I live on Route Eight, and I can tell you, it's spotty going through there. So, so down at Station Nine. Oh, it's even know. it's spotty as. But down, the only thing I'm concerned about having it at any facility like a firehouse is safety, because they've got to get in and out of there pretty quick. We yeah. wouldn't want. I mean, food lion and right. but if place, it was range, range. Yeah, if it was, if you if you had adequate parking somewhere off site, that but whatever. That's you like you said, you're in touch with these no. other okay. agencies, so we that could be safety. Worth Are you talking about Atlantic Broadband? Don't Correct. talk about. It. I wouldn't want 20 cars in the firehouse parking lot. I'm just. I'm not. What? Yes. Which, okay. We were talking about the Atlantic Broadband. My question is mm -hmm. on the outdoor wireless access kits. Is that being paid for by Title One? Is that why they're at Title One schools? Because no. there's other areas we could have put those. Sure. Um, we we decided to put in those schools because of of the need in in those communities. Um, you know, those are our most high poverty. Um, there are our poverty schools. Um, so when we looked at you know our data, it sh clearly showed an indication. Um, that those were the areas that were in most need. And by the time we were determining that was the same time the Atlantic Broadband was saying, so I'm just using this as an example, putting one at Ken Island High School when in the Atlantic Broadband, that might be one of the sites that they choose. Um, S so yes, and SMS, and they're we, practically next to each other. Right. So we chose those schools because those were the schools that indicated most families did not have the highest number of families did not have internet. Correct. Then we connected with Atlantic Broadband, and they were looking at connecting to, at some of our high schools in areas that they already have service. They don't have service at that end, so they could start working at the Kent Island end, and we could start working at the Northern County end, and so we'd sort of start getting both ends at the same time. So you're gonna reevaluate those four locations? Because, no, we're not gonna reevaluate. Because re SES and SMS, are the, they probably cover the same neighborhoods as far as people not having access. They're, right, they're across the street practically from each other. But with very different parking access. Southersville Middle has larger parking access. That's what I mean, if they have Southernville, why do we have something in SES? If, if SES families are having problems, they, they can cross the street and sit in the parking lot at SMS. You see what I mean? I don't see where it's, you need to spread it a little more. 
And that is what I don't understand. Why because you're also going to have high school students going to those parking lots. Sure. But I think what Beth's saying is have it all at the bigger lot, maybe Sellers or Miller, rather than duplicating. This duplicate. is what has been chosen. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, it, why are we, we belittled it to death at the last meeting about wireless access. But this is what they have that, chosen. It's just not a good use of, of that capability if we could move one of those somewhere else. I mean, that's why, I'm, why I was asking. I don't, I know that, I know the survey said they didn't have it, but that doesn't mean they couldn't use across the street, across the street. Yeah. Just a thought, you guys. Ought to yeah, consider. I think I think I think these are the good, the right sites um, with the numbers of families that we have. I think this is the right site. We don't have at Queen Anne's County High School at this point, and so yes, there will certainly be students from Queen Anne's County High School at one or the other. Um, I think these these are the right choices. Uh, and I'm why don't we send one of those down to Queen Anne's County High School? We're, we're we yeah yeah so we're this is phase one okay and we're right. yeah this is phase one and we're going to continue in fact we talked about how many more can we get you know most immediately in terms of the hot spots and access points so we're going to continue to work on those we obviously want all of the schools to have them eventually because let's face facts you know you hear more and more on the news every day about a second surge right and if this happens again we want to have all of our schools to have them the choices that we made were based on data i think that they are the right choices and um and we'll continue to work in phases and we'll continue to order because the other point is we're going to need um more hot spots to go out to families if we are able to do the recovery um education piece as well so we want to make sure that we continue to order we have some funding and we'll move, move that funding forward to get what we need uh, and, I, and I agree with that the only thing and I do uh, agree with Captain Kelly those two schools are close and priority wise do we better off having since those are so close together within a half a mile are we better off putting it somewhere else if that's not your decision all be it but that's I think her point the other thing I have is can any is this public access or will there be a code to get in on this and then be I mean because you know I just know a lot of people come to certain areas yeah, for sure. Wi-Fi yeah. and I wouldn't want it to jam up too much because it's primary for our students so and we do have firewalls um, you, you can't just get any old thing you know on our internet just like in this building right here I'm and it wouldn't be any about, different to log in if I go up to Summers Hill Middle School can I log in? Or you do still, I have to have you a code? still could. If yeah. if a guest walks into our buildings, they absolutely can. What they can access is controlled. I just don't want to get overwhelmed by people sitting in a parking lot when we're used. Our students should be sitting in a parking lot. That's all. What What is the distance from a hotspot that people can connect to? I mean, is it a half a mile, a quarter of a mile? Um, I don't have that data. Um, I don't have that data. Yeah, either. I can get that for you though. It just, I think it would do away with And it's certain, I, I can tell you it's not a half a mile. Um, it, yeah. It'll work on the park, parking lot, but if you go a quarter mile down the street, you're probably not going to get it. Just that like a most business, business discussion on people getting on it, unless you find a whole bunch of folks on the parking lot, they're not students. Well, and, and, they're going to be secured or on poles. Just yeah, they are. The they're building. installed on buildings. Yeah. So. If I was going to recommend anything, if some of these mobile hotspots we get them, I would say put it at Queen Anne's County High School. In, yeah, they way. have a. Yeah, they have a the largest need, and and we're we're instead focusing of going on that. into individual families' homes, put it around Queen Anne's County High School so that our high school students can have access in the parking lots there since we are not being addressed by Atlantic Broadband. The county administration building, why don't we make them do it? Well, they are assisting in this right now. But Yes, there was an email that went around. I don't, I don't know if everyone got it or not, but the county uh, connectivity, and now what was the heck, what was her name, Sid, that sent that around about? I had to look it up, I can't remember. But anyway, we all got an email about how the county is helping with Good. address the needs with Atlantic Broadband. So calendar. So our next. Um, Are we still talking about uh, internet access? I just have one question. How many? Now can I ask that question now? How many are we are not reaching? Do we know? 
So it's different at different schools. On average, I estimated about 10%. Um, and that's a loose estimation because what we did for students who have one-to-one -one devices is we can check out the number of logins. And so pretty much everybody has logged in. But we also are looking at the number of learning packets that we sent out and have not gotten any, in, any indication back by way of a photograph that students have completed that work. So that's why I gave that 10% so, estimate. So the teachers, our teachers haven't contacted them or nobody has contacted 10% of our students? That is not accurate. Um, so we have co contacted most of our students and we just got an update from our principals the other day. So most of our students we have absolutely contacted, but we haven't gotten work back from some of our students. Yeah, different subject. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just wanna make sure we've been in contact. Absolutely. We're working on that every day. Teachers are contacting students at PPWs. least once a week. And then we've got our counselors, we've got our PPWs, we've got our um, that's right, and, and more and more are helping to support the translation piece and, and those kinds of things so that we're reaching students that way as well with that the was, right that packets. That was my concern because I've heard lots of horror stories about it in other counties where these kids are just missing. And yeah. I want to make sure that wasn't happening in our nice school. And, and, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of reason for that. And, and part of it is, one, if they don't have a device, it is harder to stay in touch with them if they aren't sending the photos of their work back because we have been told that we can't get the papers back. So that's a, that's a much different task than saying, okay, I know I sent out 167 learning packets and we know that the parent says the kid got them, but I'm not getting work back. So recovery education, you know, there has to be a way to, to reach them. I was you know, on a Zoom meeting with Chris Van Hollen yesterday. Oh, good, I was too. Right, and mm -hmm. all the principal, all the superintendents we're talking about across our state, and we are ahead of the curve because we had one-to-one -one devices for our students. Yes. So yes. kudos to our county and commissioners all these Absolutely. years they have funded it because uh, they, we have put the technology into our students' hands. I for this virtual learning, we were read. prepared for this. We don't have the same issues that a lot had. No, not read. even cl close. I was listening to some of the horror stories yesterday. Absolutely Unbelievable, right. and I'm incredibly Very grateful. Mm -hmm. So 12. we have all this now. So for our district calendar, we do need to propose some calendar adjustments that we also have this item in the action um, item for action this afternoon or this evening, rather. I mentioned earlier today, Mr. P is going to click on that calendar so that you can see some color codes. Is this for the action item? It's the action item is later, but I want to share with you what, uh, what the plan is. And while Mr. P pulls that up and makes that as large as he can, recall that in the initial school closure, there were 10 days, 10 school days between March 16th and 27th. Um, the state superintendent has authority to waive five of those days. The other five days, school districts, it's incumbent upon us to figure out how we're going to account for those days. And I do want to make mention, yes, that is different from what we talked about initially, because initially we were all under the impression that those 10 days would be waived, but it, something different is happening right now. I think we'll still be okay. So I'm going to request the five days from you know March 16th, that first week. And then I'm going to use three unused snow days. We were lucky this year. We did not have one snow day. So we got those three snow days that we can go ahead and, and use. The proposal is also to include the primary election day on April 28th. Since uh, we will not have buildings open for primary elections on April 28th, they moved to June 2nd, I believe, and probably will be mail-in. Um, so we're going to use April 28th as a school day. And then Memorial Day, May 28th, I'm proposing that to be a school day since we are still um, pretty much in um, lockdown status or, or at home, stay at home orders. So Dr. Kane, 25th or 28th? Because on here it's the 25th. 25th. 25th? 25th, is that It's Monday? April 28th for primary election yes. day, May 25th okay. for Thank Memorial you. Day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so that would give us the total 10 days for the initial school closure. Questions, comments? I had a you couple. Just to vote on it? We will at a later point in the yes, in today. The meeting. I had two, two
two questions, and, and again, getting back to listening to some of the horror stories from the superintendents. Our Chromebooks, when we gave them to the third and fourth graders, mm -hmm. did we need to buy any power cords? Well, they have uh, they power, had power yeah. cords too, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know you've heard. So I, I know I did, we, we did not I mean, have that same issue. Ten no. and fifteen thousand power cords that some of the districts had to buy to uh, in our, order to get. Yeah, these our our administrator. That was okay. one of the first things they wanted to make sure that they got all that okay. packaged. My second students. question, and I'll make this fast. The assignments you're giving the students. These, this is what I wanted to find out. If you're giving them till October in order to turn these assignments into these teachers. Huh? I want to make sure that it's not violating a teacher contracts that they are having to take care of a student that they are no longer teaching. This came from the teachers. Correct. And it, it, okay. it was a recommendation from the academic deans in meeting with um, I just want to bring teachers. it out. I just want to put it out there. So that I want to make sure that they're, you know, not being made to take care of students that they're no longer teaching. Okay. All right. Sorry. That was me. Anybody else before we get into the relief funding? All right, thank you. Thank you for that one. And then these are, this is what we believe that we know right now. Um, we have received um, some information on one of our um, um, county meetings that the county is going to receive um, a certain amount of funding. It's about $8.8 .8 .8 million. I gave you a little bit of background here on the total dollars that the state of Maryland is going to receive. There's some more information, and I'm going to give you a handout so that you have the letter that I have that explains the, the dollars given to the state of Maryland um, and how those dollars are split up. But the county is going to get about $8.8 .8 million, of which they are able to spend about 4.4, about 50% of that. There's some conversation of maybe the other 50% having to go back to the state we're not clear on that at this point but those dollars are um, eligible you know for related COVID-19 expenditures and so we will be uh, requesting dollars for technologies. So when I say technology, I'm not talking about devices, but I'm talking about more hotspots, um, access points so that we can get internet connectivity and access. So that's what, and I believe, um, I think you're on those calls for that one. You may or may not be for that I one. I am. So okay. my question is, where is this money going? Is it going to our county commissioners? It is. To? The question was whether or not it was going to funnel through the health department or um, the initial. Right, John, John C Siemens office or where that's going to come from. I do not know um, for certain, but is not funneling through us. We are going to create a plan and we're giving our plan to uh, Todd Mon. And I guess, you know, the powers that be there are going to decide, you know, how the dollars are, are funneled out. But I spoke with him myself and, and he said that that was the thing that we ought to be doing. Mm -hmm. so, so basically the county hopefully received 8.8 .8 and Initially, it's going to be 4.4, 4. but that's for both counties and school. The school system is part of the county, so the school system is not separated from that. It is for the county, and the county decides how, the, how those so dollars. Like that 4.4, they might say you can have half of it, you can have all of it, you can have none of it. Correct. So we're going to, that's what we're, the plan is to ask for, you know, um, internet access, connectivity, and also, of course, supplies and services related to cleaning and sanitizing, because I'm sure that will continue to be an ongoing expense. The next pot of CARES dollars is about elementary, secondary school emergency relief. And with that, we already know we're going to have about $750,000 um, for that one. And that is for recovery education, just we talked about, um, just like I talked about this evening, um, materials, services, professional development related to recovery education, summer learning, and again, supplies um, and services related to cleaning and sanitizing. The next slide is, again, it's about our operations. You've heard multiple, multiple times about uh, meals distribution. We have linked in or, or hyperlinked all of the sites. We still have 13 locations. We've got about 39 volunteers that are steady. 55,500 meals over that have been served as of uh, this afternoon. So our teams are doing an outstanding job making sure, and I know, Captain Kelly, you're at uh, the Kent Island or you're at Bayside um, location down there. And in combination with the 
um, volunteers that are out there distributing foods and the backpacks. And there have been over 700 um, backpacks, or was it 800? It might have been over 800 backpack meals that have been distributed to date. And Amanda Enzer and um, Ms. Lee Franklin, they continue to um, spearhead ensuring that we get donations and get those backpacks and, and everything out to the community. We know that Sutlersville Elementary School also has a food giveaway that they do every uh, Tuesday. Uh, every Tuesday, um, and so those kinds of things continue. I was with Linda Austin yesterday, and they are except she was delivering food yesterday to folks that can't get to the schools, mm -hmm. and she's actually delivering food every day on mm -hmm. a regular basis, even on the weekends. And she, and I have to give a shout out to Fred and Elaine McNeil. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that Phil Dumino was out with Mr. Fred on uh, yesterday, and I know. And did Mr. Moran go yesterday? Mr. Moran's going. Yes, and uh, so everybody's hands on this. So I really, and I, I know that Annette DiMaggio is in Sutlersville area helping with them with the backpack. So I, kudos, I just thank everyone for who's doing this. But if you have time or want to donate, please get in touch with these individuals because they are, um, they're out there. They're delivering and, and filling in the, gap. filling in the gaps. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a great thing, wonderful thing. And just to, to note that the pickups for meals um, are Tuesdays and Fridays, and we give meals for multiple days now. We have our staff out there less number of days, but we are still giving meals for all of the days, um, and that seems to be working quite well. Last page here, we're just talking about things, just to follow up from our last meeting. There were many, many things that we did not know. As of the state board meeting last week, there were some answers, and so lots of those things that we didn't know are crossed off and there's still one thing that we're still working on um, and that is the annual evaluation and observations for teachers and that will be discussed at the April 28th state board meeting. Okay. Are there other questions that we have not yet responded to that we can can help with? Just out of curiosity, in this letter you just passed us, why are counties missing on the back page? I'm sorry. Why are certain counties missing on the back page? Uh, I, you didn't write it, yeah, and I know I'm you. Right. Didn't. I don't know. <laughs> I well, wait I, a minute. I do. I, I think with this one, there are. Is this the one with the five largest counties? Um, some of the, some of the bigger boards aren't on here. Yeah, the the five largest counties are not here because they are getting separate funding, and that is um, that's discussed, I believe, in the first two paragraphs. The five largest local governments um, with a population in excess of 500,000 are scheduled to receive a direct distribution from U.S. Treasury, and it gives the amount of 691 million. So those are taken out, and you won't see those on that back page. So three or, three or four of them are going to get five. As much, five is going to get twice as much as what the whole other Probably. all the county together. Gotcha. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is eight o'clock. We're supposed to be stopping now, but we still have a lot to do here. May I recommend that we take a 10 minute break? Is that Mr. Strait, you're okay with that? Okay, and because we do have a lot to do. If, if anyone has to leave, I totally understand, as um, long as three of the board members stay. Um, but I would like to take a break at, at this time, if that's all right. Yeah. Thank you all, we'll be right back. Thank you, we're back. Um, I do have a question, and uh, this is a matter of, of protocol, procedural uh, question. The grading policy, uh, other boards of education are voting on them. And it, is it required that we vote on this grading policy that you've implemented? The way our policies, as we um, share it with you, the way our policies are written, no, you don't need to. Some, po some districts have policies that are impacted. Our policies aren't written that way. Our, our processes are written in our regulations. And so the board does not need to vote on regulations. Okay. Just that to be safe? No, I mean, regulations are the superintendent's purview, policies no, are the board's. Fine. Fine. We're, we're okay. safe. And I just had a parent text me and ask, is it possible to take one of those Wi-Fis to Queen Anne's County High School rather than Southersville Elementary? So I'll just thank you. Put it out there. Okay, gotcha. Public I mean, it, yeah, I don't not beat a dead horse to death, but it does if it's feasible, it makes sense not to have two in the same location if we if you find it reasonable. Okay. 
Thank you. And, and these are for arriving May 11th. Correct. Which means there's other ones are going to take months to get where you want to. So, yeah. so we're putting uh, our orders in now. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Don't worry. It's across the state, across the United States. This Not, is happening. Right. Okay. Action items. Uh, and thank you everybody for staying. I appreciate that. Uh, the Grayson, uh, Graysonville Elementary School VCT floor replacement. Yes, President Harper. I'm uh, filling in for um, Mrs. Pohl and our facility planner tonight. Um, we're seeking board approval of a contract with Continental Flooring Company in amount of $148,880 um, to remove all the existing vinyl composition flooring, um, which we call VCT Cove base that was installed in uh, 1995 um, at Graysonville Elementary School. Um, the amount budgeted was $170,000, so we are under budget by about $21,000. The funds will be coming from the FY20 capital budget. Um, we were able to do cooperative purchasing mechanism um, to able to obtain the contract with that. Um, the VCT installed has a lifespan of about 20 years. Um, we're at the 25th year right now, and we are at the VCT will be replacing it with uh, has a lifespan of about 25 to 30 years. Um, if you recall, last year we also painted Graysonville Elementary School. So this school also has the new addition to it, so we're going to be in pretty good shape there. This comes from, if you remember, the comprehensive building assessment we had right. performed. This is one of the areas that we were um, uh, notified in that area, and it was on our, um, our capital plan. And this will along. be done now? We can start as soon as they say no schools are coming or no students are coming back. Yes. <clears throat> Any other questions? How many yes, bids did we get? It was a cooperative purchasing bid. So others are involved in Yes. Uh, yep. Okay. We, we are very limited on the... Um, I know we don't have a yeah. procurement officer, no. so... You know. Right. So this, these are the mechanisms we used last year, and it okay. actually worked out very good for us. Um, yeah, anything over 25000 Mr. Anderson, we have to go through the yep. procurement process. I understand that. Yep. And they have to have bids. You're correct. Yep. So this was through a state bidding process? And this was through a national one. Actually. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So I need a motion for the approval of the contract with Continental Flooring Company to replace the flooring at Graysonville Elementary School for the fiscal amount of $148,880 okay. from the FY 2020 Comprehensive Building Assessment. Second. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to approve the contract with Continental Flooring Company for $148,000, $148,880,000 from the FY 2020 Comprehensive Building Assessment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Barbara. Next agenda, agenda item, Churchill Elementary School interior painting. Yes, President Harper, we are seeking uh, board approval for a contract with Page Industrial Services in the amount of $121,365.02 for painting the entire interior of Churchill Elementary School, including the walls, ceilings, door frames, and previously painted doors. Um, this will also be coming out of the FY20 capital budget under the comprehensive building assessment line item. Um, we had budgeted $130,000. Uh, it's under budget by about $8,600. Uh, the last time that we painted um, this building was about 25 years ago. So if you recall, last year we were able to um, paint Graysonville Elementary School and Sellersville Elementary School using the same company, the same bid. Um, we were very successful with that. Um, we util utilized the source soil national contract, um, which is a national cooperative purchasing agreement. Um, you know, we're able to cut down on the other cost. Um, so we're seeking approval for the um, <clears throat> contract to paint Churchill Elementary School. Anyone else, any questions? No, sir. We're. Yes, yes, sir. As soon as we, and that was part of the reason. We normally, we get allocated the money, and then by the time we're allocated it, school's already started. So we usually do things like this the net following summer, 
but we're ready to go now as soon as we hear and that's why we wanted to get the contracts in place so that we can if students do not come back we can go ahead and start how long do you think it will take them to complete At those eight to ten weeks um yeah, probably even shorter than that um okay. any other questions I need a motion to approve the contract with Page Industrial Services to paint the interior <clears throat> of the building at Churchill Elementary School. Fiscal impact of $121,365.02 from the FY2020 Comprehensive Building Assessment. So moved. The motion, do I have a second? Second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote, uh, call for the approval of the contract with Page Industrial Services to paint Churchill. Fiscal impact $121,365.02 from the FY2020 Comprehensive Building Assessment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. The proposed adjusted calendar for 2019-2020 as presented in the presentations. Any questions or comments on that? I, I agree with it. I, I'm going to go to calendar. Where does it show that we're off April, whatever primary day was? Um, it is not marked in this calendar because that would indicate it would be a school day. So this would be the proposed calendar. So, but the last one we had was marked off that day? Correct. Okay. I just didn't. So this one, what I'm seeing on my com computer and what you just handed me is the revised one. Correct. If I looked at the old one, I would see it as a day. Correct. Got gotcha. you. Okay. That would be for April 28th and for May 25th. So we need a. So moved. Motion. Okay. To accept the amended. What? What question? Now, what would we do if, if we end up with the election day is June 2nd? It's still a school school day. Well, if we are in schools, then you'll see me back here asking to make an uh, adjustment. Okay. Yes. They've, they've talked about he approved mail-in, right. so. Right. Okay. So do I have a motion to accept the amended 2019-2020 school calendar? So moved. moved. Motion, I have a second. Second. Thank you. A motion and second. Any questions or comments on the motion? I call for the vote on the motion to accept the amended QACPS 2019-2020 school calendar. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you all very much. Um, as presented in closed session, the LLC contracts. Mr. Pinder, I understand that you, from, uh, I've, been, I've been getting texts by Mr. Burns, the uh, school attorney, school board attorney, that you two are meeting tomorrow, 10 o'clock? Yes. To finalize. I mean, follow up on to it. To follow okay. up on everything, yes. Okay. Tonight, or go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Um, we're seeking um, to, last time we met, we approved the um, COVID-19 payment to the bus drivers. And tonight we were seeking to um, adjust the uh, maintenance factor based upon um, the fuel factor calculating into using the AAA cost of self-service diesel per gallon from Baltimore every month on um, the 15th of the date, as long as we are still closed for the COVID-19. Um, this will bring us out to about um, a uh, $1.17 per mile for the maintenance factor. For this month? For this month. And next month may be different based upon the 15th, um, the AAA um, price. So really all I have to do is ask for a motion to approve the amendment as in closed session. Yes, ma'am. I'm asking for a motion. Oh, I'm sorry, any questions or comments at this point? It could be okay. reviewed by uh, Mr. Burns and Sid and work on it after the final. Yes, that's what Mr. Burns has yep. been texting me. Um, so I ask for a motion to accept the amendment to the bus LLC contracts as discussed in closed session. So moved. Second. Do you have to say subject to um, discussion with a lawyer? No. So we're done with this. Yeah, okay. it's amended. Right. So second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? I call for the vote on the motion to accept <coughs> the amended 
contracts for the bus contractor LLCs as proposed in closed session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. One abstention. Mrs. Wright, four ayes, one abstention. The motion is carried. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Pender. Thank you. Future meetings and events. Uh, our school board meeting in May has been pushed back to Wednesday, May 13th. Uh, our school board work session, is that still on the 20th though, Dr. Kane, or are we gonna adjust that to the 27th? Do you recommend? Of May? Yes. Normally they're two weeks apart. So are you suggesting to um, keep the 20th and the 27th? Is That's that what I'm asking. Since, I mean, since we're doing the... No, you're talking about moving to the If 27th. we're doing the 13th as our regular meeting. Mm -hmm. So move the 20th to the 27th. Well, honestly, I, the, since the county, we had moved our May 6th meeting because of the county commissioners. Right, because could, of the Could hearings. we just take it back? Can we go back to May 6th or do you think we need let's, to be? Let's confirm with them that they are not going to do some semblance of a, okay. of a hearing before we change that. Our calendar. And we, st yeah, we still have a, a couple of weeks, so I think we'll be okay if okay. we, um, when we see them next week and have a conversation, we can okay. talk about So that. after next week, we could be moving our meeting back to May 6th, depending on how the county commissioners hold their, their budget meetings. Mm -hmm. So let's leave these as it is at the moment. Yeah. With May 13th and May 20th as our school board meeting and work session, the county commissioners will see what they're doing on May 4th, 5th, and 6th uh, as far as their budget, you know, Hearings. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, town hall mm -hmm. meetings. Mm -hmm. um, any other, for the good of the order? Okay. I need a motion to go in executive closed session. Make a motion in pursuit to the general provisions of Article 3-104 of the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County and move we meet in closed session at 820 to perform administrative function. I have session. a motion. I have a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to go into executive closed session. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. We will close out from that meeting, Mr. Strait. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone coming in tonight. Please be safe and healthy. Practice your social distancing. Good night.